Eu estava ali. Em registro de ordem, parece. Ah, ok. I just, I just tried, so I think everything is working. I can, I can come back and log in again. Or I will mute okay. myself. Okay. Okay. Oh. Okay, uh, I think this will start at 10 o'clock in India time? No, 9.30. Oh, so you want me to join at 9.30 or? You, you, can, you, you can join at 9.45 oh. at okay. Indian time. And is, is there anything, I think this, I was just checking the college. This is relatively a new college was established in 2015. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Is there anything? Okay. I will do my research. I think I've done some of the research. <laughs> okay. 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 That's fine. Looks like everything is working. So I will, I will, I'll, I will, I'll be back in, in 15 or 20 minutes. Okay.
যদি কখন শুরু করবো জাস্ট তিরিশ Shomo, it's time now. Shouldn't we start? Okay. Okay, sir. Good morning, everyone. I, Dr. Shomo Shundarwati, Assistant Professor in Chemistry, heartily welcome all in the first day of today's international webinar on chemistry, a motivation in research. Organized by Department of Chemistry, Government General Degree College, KCRE, in association with IQSC and Network Subcommittee. First of all, I would like to thank all invited delegates, faculty members, research scholars and students for joining us. It is a great satisfaction for us that a huge number of participants have registered from India as well as abroad. We have designed our first day program in two parts. At first, inauguration program, our Honorable Officer in Charge, Dr. Sudipta Chakraborty, will deliver inaugural address. After that, Dr. Sutapa Re, Head of the Department, Department of Chemistry, will deliver welcome note. Our second session is technical session. Professor Deepak Ranjan Mal, former professor, Department of Chemistry, IIT Kharagpur, will chair this session. Professor Indrajit Sharma, Oklahoma University, USA, and Professor Papan Kanti Pine, ISCS Kolkata, will deliver their interesting lecture in this session. Finally, third session is the oral presentation. Professor Subhash Chandra Bhattacharya, former professor, Department of Chemistry, Jadopur University, will chair this session. We are very much delighted to have Professor Subhash Chandra Bhattacharya and Professor Deepak Ranjan Mal as a reviewer in oral session. Now, I am requesting our officer in charge, Dr. Sudipta Chakraborty, to convey his inaugural address. Good morning to all the participants, researchers, invited honored resource persons, and academic luminaries. On behalf of Government General Degree College Kishiari, I welcome you all in this first day of the two-day international webinar organized by our college. Throughout the world, the idea of higher education in the field of science is gradually transforming from the traditional concept of studying of texts and its validation in the laboratory to power promotion of uh, research ideas through academic exposures. Inculcating of the spirit of research in the basic science among young minds is quite very essential for the sustainable development of a nation and thereby conferring human and ecological welfare. In this regard, uh, the field of uh, chemical world offers a wide vista of opportunities for the aspiring students who are imbibed with the notion to apply their fundamental thoughts in solving an academic riddle or in product development. The painstaking effort of the luminaries from this swing of science has contributed manifold in the discovery of several life-saving drugs, 
characterization of compounds with dynamic applications, extraction of elements from ores, engineering, agriculture, food processing industry, nanomaterial synthesis, harnessing of nuclear and unconventional sources of energy and more. The prevailing outlook of interdisciplinary approach towards problem solving uh, and uh, through or rather I should say this interdisciplinary approach of solving problems through exchange of data between laboratories has stressed this limit of uh, research arena infinitely. The COVID-19 pandemic, though painful and damaging, has thus offered new challenges for these scientific practitioners. Uh, speaking about Government General Degree College at Keshiri, this is a remotely located institution in the district of Pashtim Medinipur of West Bengal, India. And it has effectively amalgamated this blended mode of learning and research since its inception in 2015 only. Thus, with a prudent ambition to promote the idea of research in chemistry, the Department of Chemistry of this college humbly hosts this two-day international webinar entitled Chemistry, uh, Motivation in Research by assembling distinguished scientists and faculties from international institutions of global repute, uh, as well as some international uh, in institutions of India also, who will be engaged in stimulating talks on cutting edge technologies in this field of science. The webinar would also provide a podium for participating researchers beyond the boundaries of the state to exhibit their data and findings before a competent board of reviewers. I congratulate the organizers along with the IQAC coordinators and the IT networking committee of this college who have joined hands to make this academic endeavor a reality. I wish the webinar all success and and heartily open the first portion of this session. And I declare this particular webinar as open and over to our organizers who will communicate the rest part of the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for expressing your well wishes in the very beginning of our webinar. Now, I request Dr. Sutapa Roy, Head of the Department, Department of Chemistry, to convey her welcome note. A very good morning and a warm welcome to everyone. And thank you for joining us at our two days international webinar on chemistry, a motivation in research. It is a great pleasure for me on behalf of the Department of Chemistry, Government General Degree College, to welcome all the participants from various parts of the country and also from abroad in our webinar. We are overwhelmed with your huge response. I would like to cordially welcome our distinguished speakers, Professor Indrajit Sharma from Oklahoma University, USA, Professor Tapun Kanti Pine from Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science, Kolkata. Professor Onindo Dotto from IIT Bombay and Dr. Ohit Patro from CSIR National Physical Laboratory, New Delhi in our webinar. We are very much thankful to them for giving their consent to deliver their valuable lectures in this webinar. We also welcome our guests of honor, Professor Deepak Ranjan Mal, former professor of chemistry, IIT Kharagpur, professor Shubhas Chandra Bhattacharya, former professor of chemistry, Jadukpur University, and professor Nilmuni Sharkar, professor of chemistry, IIT Kharagpur. And we are thankful to them for making this webinar brighter with their gracious presence. As the head of the department, it is my privilege to introduce our department. Department of Chemistry started its journey on 30th July 2016 with only two faculty members. I am feeling proud to share with you that our department has already successfully contributed to major individual DST SAR projects within this small time, along with a number of research papers at various international journals of repute. This international webinar is the first attempt 
from this young department. Indian common undergraduate curriculum broadly classifies chemistry into four main fields, namely organic chemistry, inorganic chemistry, physical chemistry, and material chemistry. In this webinar, it is our sincere attempt to arrange four distinguished lectures on these specializations. Our distinguished speakers grace this webinar with presenting their valuable knowledge and state-of-the-art research in the domain of modern chemistry. Without elaborating further, I would like to conclude my welcome address at this point. Once again, I would like to welcome you in this webinar. Hope you will enjoy all the sessions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sutapare, for such warm welcome note. Now, I request our officer in charge, Dr. Sudipta Chakravorty. Sir, please open our e-book. Sir. Sir. And just a minute. Uh, is the screen visible? Yes, sir. So here comes the abstract volume compiling all the papers from our honored research persons and the researchers who has contributed to depict their data in the form of formal seminar in the ongoing proceedings. Chemistry, a motivation in research. So this is the abstract volume. And this being the table of contents. And this will be circulated to the participants who has really contributed in this volume. So uh, thank you all. Stay tuned. Thank you, sir. Now, inauguration program is closed here. Now we will move to our first technical session, where two renowned scientists, Professor Indrajit Sharma and Professor Papal Kanti Pine, will present their wonderful work. To chair this session, I am inviting Professor Deepak Ranjan Mal, former professor, Department of Chemistry, IIT Kharagpur. Please, sir. Sir, please unmute your mic. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Hello? Yes, sir. Okay, you are audible. Okay, I'm here now. 
Okay, uh, is Indrajit uh, present now? Or should we start now or a little later? Yes, I am here. Oh, hello, Indrajit. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. How are you? Okay. How are you doing? All right. Al almost a year after, right? Yes, yes, meeting, yeah. Uh, okay. And uh, to start with, I should congratulate you on becoming associate professor. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, are you ready to go ahead, or uh, we will uh, uh, we'll start at uh, uh, ten or nine forty-five? Which, which I am, uh, suits you? I am. I am. I am almost ready. Whenever they want, I can start. Yeah, I am ready. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's wait and uh, see what Sutapa says. Sir, start the session, please, sir. Uh, yeah. I'll start this. Okay. Uh, okay. Welcome to the first session of this webinar, uh, Chemistry, a Motivation and Research. And, uh, uh, today we have two speaker in this, uh, speakers in this session. Uh, the first speaker is Dr. Indrajit Sharma from the Oklahoma University, USA. And uh, very briefly, I will introduce him uh, to the audience or, or these uh, participants in this seminar. Uh, Indrajit has been known to me for the, uh, more than 18 years. Uh, he started his career, uh, he joined an academic career, uh, earning B.S.C.D. honors degree in De from Delhi University in 2004. Then he joined uh, IIT Kharagpur for his master's degree, uh, uh, with which he graduated in 2006. And uh, uh, during the, the IIT time, he, he worked uh, with me uh, for the anthracyclines research and subsequently he moved to USA uh, to uh, do his PhD at the University of Wayne State University in Detroit with Professor David Kreis and he completed his PhD in 2011. Uh, following the PhD degree uh, he pursued uh, postdoc research uh, with uh, DS Tan and work on the development of new antibiotics and the antibiotic libraries. And uh, in 2014, uh, he started his independent career as an assistant professor at the University of Oklahoma. And uh, he's now an established company, uh, sorry, sorry, established um, researcher. And uh, he has uh, truly developed uh, a carbon chemistry on uh, different therapeutic therapeutic leads, and uh, the, uh, he has been awarded many honors. But, uh, I think I'll just uh, tell one or two. Uh, he was selected among the top 14 assistant professors by ACS American Chemical Society, and uh, now he's an associate professor there. And his uh, areas are now. Uh, include a cancer, infectious diseases, and neurological disorder, but um, mainly he's focusing on the carbon chemistry. And I would like to hear him now and see what more he has to say. Uh, with this uh, few words, I request um, Professor Indrajit Sharma to deliver his lecture. Uh, Indrajit? Yes. Um, okay. Okay. Okay, okay, good. Can ready. you hear me? Oh, yes, I can hear you. Okay. Can you see my screen? I, I can see. Yes, yes. Okay. okay. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Mal, for the kind introduction, and uh, and also I would like to thank you, the the organizing committee, uh, basically for providing me this opportunity to to share my research here, and also uh, this is a great ini initiative given the situation of uh, pandemic, and I also admire the effort of college administration because I was just looking and and doing some some homework that this is a relatively new college established in 2015. 
so so i i really admire their effort uh, to organize this uh, international webinar chemistry and motivation research and i would i would try my best to give you some perspective uh, uh basically the theme is really good a uh, chemistry motivation research and, and how chemistry particularly carbon chemistry has inspired us uh to do drug discovery and and identified a compound for cancer and neurological disorders so before i dive into my my research i would like to share my previous research experiences and and basically uh, as uh, uh, professor mal pointed out i completed my undergraduate research at iit kharagpur in 2006 uh, and i was working there with dr ray and she was my immediate mentor so again a uh, thank you dr ray for for teaching me my my first research uh, that how to do column chromatography how to run reactions and i still remember we used to bring liquid nitrogen uh, to do this annulation reaction which was uh, generally performed at negative 78 so so after this i moved to university of illinois chicago uh, in 2006 and then my my boss uh, professor kreich moved to wayne state university in 2007 where i completed my degree uh, working on uh, glycopeptide chemistry where i did study some some carbohydrate chemistry and and in mechanistic studies uh, to make a uh, stereoselective anomeric functionalization and also chemical synthesis of of peptides and peptide thioesters and after that i moved to sloan kettering cancer center uh, basically uh, to learn chemical biology with professor derek tan uh, and i was there for 3 years and then you can clearly see i have highlighted d so these are three d's of my life who who taught me so much and whatever i am going to share today i am uh i am who i am today because of because of all three of them so so in 2014 i started my independent career at the university of oklahoma that time they started this institute called institute of natural products and this is a research building i was really impressed with this new building i was hired as a synthetic chemist here and this is a team of people basically involving people who do natural product isolation organic synthesis medicinal chemistry chemoenzymatic diversification pharmacology and proteomics so basically it's a full drug discovery program where we can take a natural product from isolation to all the way uh, to to clinic so so what is my my research program and my research overview so basically uh, uh, we have a uh, three or four different projects going on and the first project is this non addictive painkiller so we are trying to develop non addictive painkiller or anti itch compound so you have you have heard of morphine story a uh, morphine is a very effective painkiller but it has the side effect of addiction and and this project has been funded by uh, nida and and ocast and we have these wonderful collaborators uh, at mount sinai hospital university of southern california vanderbilt university and and ics in france so this compound is coming from a room and i will be telling a story about this the, the, the second project we have on carbon chemistry where we are trying to access bioactive scaffold particularly spirocycles and medium sized rings uh, which are underrepresented in drug discovery because of challenges associated with their synthesis and and this is a collaborative project again with doy agro science lily uh, pharma company uh, nimh psychoactive drug screening program and has been funded by nsf early career award which is a national science foundation here and a doctor new investigator award from american american chemical society we also have a third project where we are trying to uh, uh, basically develop neuroprotective agents so like in older adults uh, after 60 uh, basically loss of neurons lead, leads to alzheimer and, and other diseases also when you meet an a road accident or something you, you lose a lot of neurons what we generally call brain hemorrhage in in india and we are trying to develop some of those those compound and this project has also been funded by cobrain ocast and finally we also have an industrial collaboration with with astrogenica where we are trying to develop lipid based carriers in, in for drug delivery particularly of psi rna what the, the thing the theme which relates all these projects as the, the the title of the webinar is it's basically the chemistry the carbon chemistry we are trying to utilize that chemistry to access all these diverse scaffolds so i today i'm going to focus on these two projects initially i wanted to talk only about carbon chemistry but i was instructed by dr ray that i should talk some some chemical biology or my biology project so i want to make it little bit more diverse rather than focusing on just organic synthesis so why carbon chemistry what is so unique about carbene 
why am I interested in carbon chemistry? So as an undergraduate, because uh, maybe there are a lot of college kids who are joining this talk. So you have heard of carbocations, which have an MTP orbital and uh, basically they react with, with nucleophiles. You have also heard of carbon anions. Uh, generally in undergraduates, uh, the, these things are always taught and they react with electrophiles. And then we have seen SN1, SN2 reactions. What is carbene? And, and trust me, I only knew a little bit about carbenes, uh, but when I came in PhD also, no one really taught carbenes that much. So I will tell you the, the story how I got interested in carbene, but carbene is very unique. And, and this is a Fisher type carbene, which is ambiphilic. Why this is ambiphilic? Ambiphilic because if you can see my pointer, uh, it basically got an empty uh, P orbital and a sp2 uh, filled uh, orbital. And this is why this carbene can react with both nucleophiles and electrophiles. And this is why this carbene is ambiphilic. So why ambiphilicity is, is important in, in this particular case? Because the ambiphilicity can allow... Just go ahead. Imagine your stripes are not visible. Oh, my structures are not visible? No. No, we can see, uh, but... Oh, you can I see? see. Uh, it, it's okay, visible okay. to us. Uh, we can see it. Uh, okay, okay. Oh, okay, 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 I got it now. I think I got it. Okay. Uh, I guess, I guess, uh, no, but... Uh, why, do, you, do you see why my cursor? Why can't, uh, can't I... Uh, just hold on. Yes, I got, now I see. Okay. Okay. Do you, see. do you do? You, okay. Thank you. Do you see my cursor moving? Now I see. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Uh, so basically, I was here at the at the carbine and carbine are MB filling. Uh, no. Uh, no, though. Uh, but uh, yes, now okay. I see. Yes, we can we can see your presentation. Maybe, maybe, maybe it is a network problem in the cells place. Okay, okay, okay. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, so basically, uh, okay, 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 thank you. So, so, so carbines are ambiphilic in nature. Uh, they have an MTP orbital and also a filled sp2 orbital. They can react with nucleophiles and electrophile at the same time. Why this is important? Because we can do cascade reactions. And generally, if you do drug discovery, uh, basically cost of a drug is depend upon a number of synthetic steps. So you can, you can think about the, the drugs which are very expensive, like a uh, taxol, because they, they require multi-step synthesis compared to like paracetamol or something, you know, what we call tenanol in US, uh, that is like acetaminophen that takes only one step. So that is extremely cheap. You can buy like in one rupee in India. So, so our goal here in cascade reaction is that if you want to go from A to D, you can go through in these three steps, A to B, B to C, this is called a linear synthesis. But if we can do multiple reactions in single step, that is what we call cascade reactions. Uh, and I feel that this carbon chemistry, the ambiphilic reactivity can provide that. So we can achieve multi, multiple transformation in one, one step without isolating intermediate. And this is basically, uh, inspired by Mother Nature because Mother Nature is, is really good doing multi-step reactions in one pot using enzymes. So the goal of this this talk and goal of my research group is to use carbon chemistry uh, and and trying to harness ambiphilicity of carbon chemistry to to access these bioactive scaffold. So why natural products and why the bioactive scaffold? Uh, so natural products have been known in drug discovery for a long time. 54% of natural products or their derivatives uh, are basically uh, uh, the drug molecules. And, and according to World Health Organization, 65% of population is still rely on natural product-based medicines. Interestingly, 78% of antibiotics and 62% of anti-cancer drugs, what we have currently in market, are derived from natural products. But most pharma companies have abandoned these, these natural products program because of their structural complexity, but also, also the patent issues with, with natural products because uh, sometimes it's very difficult to patent natural products. And uh, fewer new drugs are coming, you know, despite R&D investment. And there's some targets. Are are some 
can you hear me yes yes okay sorry can you? i was hearing some background noise but anyway so what is the difference between natural product based drug or 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 a synthetic molecule so you can clearly see these two structures right here so so the one difference to synthetic chemist or chemistry students is basically the number of stereocenters you can see that the left hand left hand side structure basically looks more complex and the average studio centers are six in a in a natural product based drug compared to only two in a synthetic drug and that's why synthetic drugs are are easy to synthesize they are they are much cheaper so uh, you can clearly see natural product can address a wide range of targets uh, but basically still we lack this flexible efficient approaches to natural product scaffold so there are two general approaches to drug discovery so basically one is target based screening when you really know your target so right right now covid situation is going on and we really don't understand the target once you know the target then it's easy to develop uh, a, a drug molecule so you have the structural information you have mechanistic information and then you also know about the binding pocket so so and another approach is called phenotype screening when you don't know your target so you basically screen a number of different molecules against different targets and try to identify a lead and both approach have been successful so in target based screening there is an example of our natural product colibolide we know the target we know this compound uh, targets kappa opioid receptor its affinity is 0.9 nanomolar and so so we understand everything the, the second is a diversity oriented synthesis approach where we don't know the target so we synthesize a, a series of compound diverse structures more than 500 structures or thousand sometime up to a million we screen them and basically try to identify a drug lead so, so we are going to talk about uh, both in the phenotype screening or diversity oriented synthesis. Our lab is focusing on these two scaffolds: spirocycles and medium-sized rings. Why spirocycles? Because they are challenging to to access because of this quaternary center right here, or what we call a spirocenter. And the medium-sized rings, uh, I mean, ring between eight member to twelve member. So you can clearly see five membered rings are easy to synthesize, six membered, even seven membered. But once it reached to eight membered ring, it's very, very difficult to access. And Taxol, the molecule I was giving you, the structure has eight membered ring. If you ever look closely on the Taxol structure. So first I will talk about this drug discovery project, target based screening or rational design about the colibolide. So let me tell you about the opioid uh, epidemic in, in United States. And also this has been a big problem in India or globally. But in US, basically the economic burden of 78.5 billion a year in healthcare costs, lost productivity, addiction treatment, and criminal justice, justice involvement. Almost 2 million people in US suffer from the substance use disorder and, and almost 900,000 suffer from heroin use disorder. So you have heard of morphine and, and then heroin. Uh, and overdose increased 30% from July 2016 to September 27 and right now if you look at the recent data this has been increasing globally and then Midwest region in US uh, particularly Oklahoma Texas uh, they basically uh, have increased by 70 percent and and nowadays this is not only a problem of rich people but also even the the, the poor people on the streets and all that you know they they try to misuse drugs and I was just hearing some some debates on news about the, the recent case like Sushant Singh Rajput in India that he was also taking some drugs or something. So people really get addicted to this. And this has been a big problem of, of, of opioid, uh, uh, opioid addiction in, in US and globally. Uh, and Oklahoma is right now ranked number five. And I make this joke all the time that when I joined in 2014, it used to be ranked number one. So we have made some improvement. Now we are at number five, maybe because of me. But this is just a joke here. But anyway, how this started. So the opioid epidemic started basically that 5% of US population. So US only has 5% of world population because more than 50% people live in India and China. And we use 55% of world morphine. And this whole morphine is coming from basically uh, Afghanistan and then some parts of India. And almost 85% of oxycodone and 95% of hydrocodone of the world supply, 5% of this population is using. And, and you can clearly see even in, in some countries like South Africa that even uh, if you are delivering a baby and you are going through a C-section, still they don't give you a painkiller. And, and this is so pathetic. And here you can just get painkiller like, like anything. It's like freely available. So, so opioid addiction is rare in pain patient. This was basically uh, an advertisement 
uh, published and and the risk of addiction is much less than 1%. And this paper was published in 1980. And this paper was cited like almost 824 times. So before they came to know this in 1999, almost in 20 years that know these things are addictive, uh, it basically uh, went out of their hands. And, and since then they're trying to control it, but it has been very difficult. So, so recently the Johnson & Johnson company was also charged $572 million uh, in the opioid trial because of their fake advertisements. So sometimes when we watch TV advertisement, pharma companies give us or they provide misinformation. So they have to be careful. So what is opioid receptor to, to all of you who are new to this field? So there are like three or four different receptors, but there are three main receptors called mu, delta, and kappa. And what is mu receptor? So mu is basically named after morphine, which was discovered in 1805, almost uh, more than uh, 200 years back. And delta of uh, basically again the the name deference and then the kappa because of the keto cyclazine that the first ligand which targets the opioid receptor. So they are they are they are found in in brain and then you know a spinal cord and and other parts of our body. So basically the mu opioid receptor is a target. It's a very effective painkiller target. That's why morphine is so popular and heroin and and another other drugs came out of it. So but the problem with with mu opioid uh, or receptor activation that it called euphoria. So this is why the heroin name is because they try to convert morphine uh, to less addictive form, but they end up making heroin and heroin means that you feel like a hero. So you feel you, you feel like euphoric and it caused euphoria. And this is why, you know, you get addicted to this. While the kappa opioid receptor is a target, it can also uh, treat pain and itch. But basically, the kappa, if you target the, those drugs called depression or dysphoria. So when you take kappa, on the other hand, you feel really sad and then depressed. So you don't want euphoric behavior as well as you don't want dysphoric behavior. Because that is also bad. Once you get into depression, you can end up doing suicide because almost 30% of people who, who are depressed more than a year, they end up taking their own life. So, so this is not good. So there has been a theory. <clears throat> which was published a paper in 2015 that that you can basically uh, remove the side effect of depression or, or dysphoria on kappa opioid receptor if you make a selective compound to G protein compared to beta arrestin. So I don't want to go much more in depth, but basically that if you can stop the, 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 the signaling to beta arrestin, you can make a selective drug and that can basically treat pain, itch or addiction without causing depression or hallucination. And there have been some papers published. One lead structure is RB64. So when I was at Sloan Kettering, uh, this the first paper came out in 2012. And, and I was new to this field. I never knew anything about opioid because this is not my training. So I met this guy, Dr. Majumdar, and we used to have happy hour. Uh, uh, basically, every Friday, they used to provide free drinks. So, you know, this is why we used to go. But sometimes happy hours or social gathering is good. So we were talking and he was telling me that, hey, what are you doing in this field? Why don't you come in the opioid? We don't have many chemists in this. So, so we, can, we can try to have a collaboration. And this is how he introduced me to the field. And when I looked into this carefully, there were so many problems and challenge. But also, most importantly, this field has a lot of money involved also because of this, this big opioid problem. This is a public health crisis. So, so when we were looking at this, uh, we came across this structure called salvinorin. This is a plant in, in Mexico, salvia, and this plant caused uh, basically hallucination. So people in the old times, they used to use these leaves uh, to, to basically uh, do this, 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 this cause hallucination and, you know, in, 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 in some, some of their traditions. And Tom Prasanjano at University of Kentucky is right now a leader in this field. Uh, and this compound has like seven nanomolar affinity to opioid receptor. So when we were digging into the literature, we came across this molecule called colibolide. And the first paper on this molecule was published in 1974 in French. And generally natural products always go unnoticed. And the, and the main reason is that uh, people used to isolate them, but they never care about biological activity or people were interested only in their total synthesis. So this guy, Dr. Joseph Perello, uh, he was a visiting scientist at Vanderbilt. He came to give a talk at Mount Sinai Hospital. This is how I came into this field and we were interested in, in this molecule. So interestingly, Dr. Joseph Perello had almost 50 milligram of the sample because he was a PhD student when, when this molecule was discovered. So he is a co-author in this paper. You can see Joe Perello. 
And now he got retired actually, and this is why he moved to US because in retirement age in France is 60. And US has no retirement age. So he's a visiting scientist. Uh, and basically the long story short, uh, we got the colibolite. First thing we confirmed the structure by X-ray. Then it was found to be nanomolar affinity, 0.9 molar. It was highly selective to kappa. It has no affinity to mu or delta. So, so selectivity is very, very important. You don't want to target mu receptor because it will be a problem like morphine. And interestingly, this was biased towards G protein signal, signaling over beta arrestin, what I was telling you. So this means that this compound will not cause dysphoria or depression. And these are some of the, the graphs here uh, that uh, that compare to the other non ligand salinorin or U69593. There is a flat thing you see for the colibride. It means this is highly, highly selective and this does not recruit beta arrestin. So this was this was basically an inspiration. So we published this result in, in a PNS paper in 2016, and we got really, really excited about this project. And then we did further study that whether this compound is an effective painkiller or not, we were very happy to know that basically uh, that if you do a knockout study in mice, so if you remove the kappa opioid receptor, there's no activity. It means this compound is highly selective to kappa only. But also the painkiller activity here is the colibolite and salvinorin A. So we also did anti-itch activity test because uh, if you know anyone who is suffering from, from pain or who is basically taking painkillers, uh, they also have a big itch problem. So sometimes you will watch videos on YouTube, uh, they keep scratching and, and, and this is a really, really big problem, people who basically get morphine treatment. So, so this is really, really effective for, for itch also, almost 50-fold uh, more selective. And then we also did a painkiller test. So the way you check the painkiller activity of a compound that you take a mice, you inject the compound. So if you don't inject the compound and you put the tail of the mice on the hot plate or you basically uh, put a laser on it, mice will move the tail. But if you inject the compound to the brain, then mice will not move the tail and the tail will burn. So, so this is a very painful test, but this is how people test it. So then they sacrifice a the mice. So once you inject the compound, our compound was very effective for 20 minutes, but but 20 minutes uh, is the maximum half-life. And, and basically we realized that generally for a drug, you should have at least almost two hour half-life, 1.5 to two hour, because you don't want to take a drug every 20 minutes. You want to take a drug every four or six hours. So morphine has like 2.5 hours, so this was not good. And we figured it out that the problem is that this compound is very hydrophobic, but also it got metabolic instability. So we collaborated with the computational chemist, Dr. Kettrich, and then we identified the binding pocket of, of this, this molecule, that how it binds to the opioid receptor. So the next goal for us was that to, to uh, figure out that what can we do. So first thing what we did, we did a gram scale extraction of this molecule uh, in collaboration with Joseph Parello. So this compound is found uh, basically in the forest close to Paris, France. And this mushroom is grown in the spring season uh, around March or April. And basically, we got more than 20 gram of these two compounds called colibolide and epicolibolide. And then, uh, basically, once you do semi-synthetic diversification to modify these structures, we made a series of compound. And and we we are basically uh, 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 identified a compound called MN74, which is Nick Masaru 74, which was having a one nanomolar uh, uh, one nanomolar affinity to opioid receptor. So, so this was good, and basically we checked the MN74, uh, and it also has no affinity to mu and delta, but also it was biased toward G protein signaling, signaling over over beta arrestin. So we are also doing itch and pain activity for for this compound, and then we are trying to get a co-crystal structure. But let me tell you the the metabolic instability problem that 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 how so we also compare the drug-like properties. So this is the colibolide on right hand side. It got a six member lactone right here and, and then MN74 got a five member lactone. And if you know uh, in organic chemistry, five member rings or five member lactone, this is butyrolactone is much more stable than this valerolactone. So, so interestingly, I want to point out these two data here that colibolide has a half-life of 2.6 minutes. And, and basically uh, right here, microjomal stability, but the MN74 has 45 minutes. So it's still not perfect, but it's a significant improvement compared to colibolide. And also it got enhanced aqueous solubility because you can clearly see the structure has some free hydroxyl group right here. 
So this is Colibri at the same and 74. We are further diversifying these structures and we are making some other changes uh, to, to improve the, the stability of this compound as well as we want to maintain the affinity also. So the so goal is basically to get a compound with T half of at least more than an hour, maybe close to two hours while maintaining nanomolar affinity and biased activity also. Because we do want a very selective compound. So we are we are doing some some simplified analog or design using computational docking. So we wanted to modify these these three rings A, B, and C. So by semi-synthesis, you can easily change A ring, but B or C are very very difficult. So we were looking at some of the approaches, and and if you are thinking of a synthetic chemistry, you can clearly see that maybe you can synthesize A and B ring using a diesel solder chemistry. But the problem here is that it basically got a furan, and furan is very very important for the activity. Or the heterocycle, so you can't do diesel solder here because this will have basically polymerage. So, so that's why we thought of carbon chemistry to access these these diverse structure. So, so when we are thinking of carbon chemistry to to access this, we came up with this this idea and this design that we can take this diazo compound right here, and I will tell you more about diazo in second half of my my talk. Uh, that that how these diazo compound are a versatile a precursor to to carbenes. So you can take this propargic alcohol and this, this melonate, and then you can do a copper catalyzed insertion to diazo compound. And then what happens once you insert it, it basically forms aline because uh, of this alkyne and then, then this, this copper right here uh, goes and form aline. So this is the aline intermediate. And what happens in aline intermediate, you can do everything in one pot. Then the melonate comes and does a Michael addition and form this compound. And finally, it does the SN to electronization from this position to this toe cell to kick out to get 68% of this compound. So interestingly, what we can do, we can do five transformations in one pot using carbon chemistry. So this is the power of this, this chemistry. This is just one example, but you will see many more examples in, 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 in my talk later on. So now we are applying this to natural product core structure. Basically, we are, we are attempting the, the total synthesis of colibride as well as a natural product called ricocarpin. Uh, which is also from the same family of uh, terpene electrons. So what is the, the, the conclusion in, in this part and the future directions in this project that, that basically we were able to identify colibride uh, in collaboration with Joseph Parello and, and Dr. Lakshmi Devi at Mount Sinai Hospital. And then we are also able to make a lead compound called MN74, which also has almost similar affinity, 1.3 nanomolar, and with improved uh, half-life of 45 minutes. So this is our current lead compound. We have done the structural activity relationship, and then uh, we have these optimized uh, lead candidates right now uh, with enhanced aqueous solubility and metabolic stability. And we are trying to use carbon chemistry to, to synthesize more diverse scaffold, and which can act as potential drug candidate for pain and age with reduced side effects. So this is the, this is the goal of this multidisciplinary uh, uh, collaboration to develop a anti each compound and as well as effective painkiller without having the side effect of addiction. So with this, I'm trying to switch gears now. So, so, so be ready for hardcore synthetic uh, chemistry uh, and which we call diversity oriented synthesis. So I will start first with the sparrow cycles and then I will move to, to medium sized rings. So basically uh, coming back to sparrow cycles that they are found in a wide range of natural products and drug molecules right here. And they're also found in approved chiral ligands. And this is an essential medicine from, from WHO. And, and this is in top 200 brand name drugs right here. You will see this. And they are also recently, uh, you will see these in the asymmetric catalysis, this is sparrow box ligand. They have been really, really popular. What is so unique about sparrow cycles? Because of their rigid structure. And I will give you an example in drug discovery that there is a compound right here from Merck. It's MT1602. It basically, if you don't have this sparrow ring here, if you have a linear structure, this compound got metabolic liability. But once you make a make a sparrow ring, then it basically eliminates those those liability, and this compound is completely stable. So, so because of their rigidity, uh, they they enhance metabolic stability. What is the problem? They are found less than 0.1 percent in NIH screening collection because of the synthetic challenge associated with the installation of sparrow center. So we are not the first one when we, we started, you know, in 2014 to look into uh, sparrow cycles. A lot of people have been interested. There have been multiple papers, a lot of wonderful approaches, but most of the approaches uh, start from a linear precursor and there are sometimes lack of stereo control. So 
so if you are not a not a synthetic chemist and you know even my my three year old kid can do this design the best way to make a molecule is to basically divide it into into half so if you can basically divide into two pieces you can easily join it in a convergent approach so this was the goal that if we can basically uh, uh, make this in, in one step so what you need if you divide into two you need something which has a plus and minus right here and you can add a nucleophile as well as an electrophile and in one step you can make this a spirocenter and how do you get plus and minus and that is carbene what i described that this is mb filling and this is kind of an inspiration from my PhD work, although my PhD thesis looks like on synthesis of peptides and sugar chemistry. But my boss, David Kreich, uh, who was very adamant, so I had to work six months in dark uh, making the compound. We were trying to, to apply that in the, in the peptide synthesis. So this is how I got interested in during my PhD. I was like, you know, I will take it as a challenge and, and maybe we'll solve it. So basically, what was our approach initially? We take a diazo compound, we make a metal carbene, which is ambiphilic, so like plus and minus, we can add a nucleophile and trap this with an electrophile. And we can easily install quaternary in a spirocenter. But nothing is as easy as on the paper. On paper, everything looks easy. So, so before, you know, I, I, I dive into this, let me, let me tell you a myth about these compounds that they are considered unstable and explosive. So this is something that three classes of diazo compound. One is acceptor, acceptor, which have two electron withdrawing group, acceptor, and acceptor donor. And this is the general rule. You can write it if number of carbon plus number of oxygen divided by number of nitrogen is greater than three in any organic molecule or any, any molecule, then you can basically store that up to 20 gram. So as long as you, you basically do this or there's something called rule of six, six carbons per energetically functional group, then they are stable. But if something is more stable, then it's very difficult to decompose. So that was the first challenge in this chemistry. The second challenge was that even if we decompose, we make this metal carbene. Once we add a nucleophile, particularly a protic nucleophile, then the problem is that we can get this competing one to proton transfer. And this is kind of the dead end. But we wanted to trap this with an electrophile. Because if you look at the TMS diazomethane reaction with, with carboxylic acid, which have been known for a long time, then you just end up making a methyl ester. That is a one to proton transfer. So if we do stepwise, then there's a problem of losing stereoselectivity. So we wanted to trap this with an electrophile and we wanted to do this cascade approach. So first we were looking into like literature uh, with this acceptor of a diazo compound, they can react, but you can clearly see literature that people were using like acid, like very simple acetic acid as a solvent or like benzoic acid reaction time was very long. So my student uh, was screening some, some conditions and I, I told her to screen with an amino acid. If something is going to work with amino acid, then it's going to work with 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 simple carboxylic acids and and i am a peptide chemist by training in my phd so amino acid makes more sense to me so when we did this with amino acid you can clearly see right here that that this was again i will say serendipity or or, or something that we were screening different catalysts and and my student Aryan hunter asked me rhodium 2 esp2 so i bought it really i have this theme that whatever you know uh you will say I will I'll buy it. Like we will provide you all the chemicals. So rhodium catalysts are very expensive. It's like 100 milligram is more than $100. But interestingly, this this rhodium 2 ESP2 basically give 94% yield within 10 minutes. A 10 minute is kind of more time. As soon as you add it, the reaction is done. And this is basically what developed by Dubois for CH ammunition. And you know, if you think of the ESP. And you look at the structure, the ESP makes no sense. The abbreviation, basically ESP is the name of the student. Uh, basically, this girl name was Christina Espino. <clears throat> so Dubois named this, this uh, compound or this ligand on name of uh, his student. So, so basically, this reaction works with a variety of uh, carboxylic acid. You can clearly see it also works in presence of free alcohols. Uh, right here is the, the free NH, uh, free phenol. But what we were really interested in seeing that you can have a number of double and triple bond and then reaction is highly, highly chemoselective. It does not do any cyclopropanation, non for carbon chemistry or cyclopropanation. So there's a high chemoselectivity in presence of pi system. This was selected as a front cover page. But, but what we were very much inspired with this, that when my student was doing the reaction with a alkynoic acid, we not only got this insertion compound 93%, but we always take a crude NMR. The crude NMR, we saw some of the alkene peaks. We saw this like in less than 5%, but you can clearly see these alkenes are very unique. They come between 5 and 6. 
compared to there is nothing in this starting material or the product which will come between five and six. So we thought that we are, I think, doing a cascade reaction and which is called a coniine transformation. So in literature, there were like no report of coniine cyclation that time on the carbonyls. So we thought that we can basically optimize this to, to access spirocycles also. So if we take a cyclic diazo compound, we can end up making a spirocycle. So we screened a lot of, uh, lot of uh, Lewis acids to, to promote coniine and my student was able to identify this uh, gold and silver triflate combination which generate gold triflate in C2 that this works in two hours. But what was the magic in this reaction that when we thought can we do this in one pot, can we mix rhodium gold and silver together to make spirocycles. So there is always a compatible reactivity challenge in metal catalyst turnover pathways or for each catalytic system redox compatibility. But we were very happy to see, and I will show you a video here. So this reaction is as fast as you, you can see in the video. This basically literally takes two minutes. So there is something unique about rhodium gold combination and then we have done some we have done some mechanistic studies in this 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 is very unique to only rhodium gold and then we end up making these sparrow uh, molecule or in this case this uh, this uh, uh, gamma beta rolacton in in very high yield so we applied this to to multiple scaffold uh, to this tetrahydrofuran gamma beta rolacton and uh, initially this paper was submitted to Angon Wante, but because of just one reviewer we we ended up in the the chemistry of in general but this chemistry has been applied to, to access these type of quaternary centers. And, and here is an example that this, this compound can be synthesized using this chemistry in, in literally in few steps compared to the seven steps in less than 10% yield of original route. But we were uh, able to apply this to the, the sparrow molecules. And here's an example of natural product called berkelemite. And basically we can make this, this diazo compound, we can divide this molecule into half at gram scale using an amino acid called l leucine and we can do this this OH insertion conia in in one step to 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 get to this uh, this this highly rigid structure of this this berkelemite code the 66 percent yield we can start with dual leucine and we can get down on the enantiomer also so 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 this is this is really really important and those results were published in in this in this paper we also did some mechanistic studies that that or some computational studies that why this reaction is selective uh, again, very briefly, there, there was found to be 2.8 kilocal per mole energy difference in the transition state, and this is why this gives a single dye streamer. Uh, uh, we can obviously talk about uh, more. Uh, I think we are, we are going to write a paper and we are, we are going to put all these results. We also did some deuterium labeled studies here. And interestingly, uh, right here, you will, you will notice that if we make this, this last example right here in linear, it's very difficult to cyclize. So if we do stepwise, so it has to be a premix of rhodium gold together. With deuterium, you can clearly see there is almost a full incorporation of deuterium, so there is, there is no loss here. And then we also did a deuterium labeling study is, is, is right here. So, so these results, uh, basically, we were able to propose a mechanism. And this is what we believe that, that what is going on here, that we take this diazo compound, we make this rhodium carbene, and then uh, XH, which can be oxygen, carbon, as well as nitrogen, can insert and this alkyne is activated by gold at the same time to to give this rhodinolate which cyclized to give coniine. This is competing pathway called one two proton transfer. We get insertion and this is very very difficult to cyclize or give the coniine uh, when we are dealing with just donor acceptor compounds. So this is what we believe is, is going on here. We have also applied this to to you know other other sparocycles and this paper was published last year. So we can do a sp two ch activation in this chemistry like right here and then the coniine we have also applied this to like nitrogen insertion and coniine cyclization to to get diverse structures so i think i have maybe like of maybe 15 or 10 minutes left so i will move to the last part of my talk on medium size rings so again they are found in a lot of natural products and in bioactive scaffolds but let me tell you something about medium size rings so what do i mean with medium size rings so the rings so you look at this this graph here this is three member four five six seven you can clearly see from 3 to 7 are very easy and then right here in the blue circle is the 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 and those are called medium sized rings. After 12 then the rings are easy to synthesize. So they did a study in this 1981 paper 
that did it electronization here in leaving group classical SN2 reaction and, and this is what they found that 8 to 12 are very, very difficult uh, to, to electronize. There are some examples right here for the electronization uh, with OH coupling uh, to carboxylic acid, 78% yield if you have less a uh, functional group 24 and here 0% yield. Another example with Nobel Prize winning chemistry, uh, Grubbs metathesis, you can clearly see 81% yield or 0% yield. So these things are highly, highly challenging to, to, to access and they are highly substrate dependent. So we are not the first one to look into this. So basically the one goal is that you can try to make these two end together, but there is a high entropy barrier, or you can try to do ring expansion. So you make these two small rings and break them to make a medium size ring or a large ring. What is the problem? Uh, the problem is that when you make these medium, these smaller rings, like right here, it takes multi-step synthesis, like eight steps to make this compound. Then you do ring expansion. So you don't want to basically uh, invest eight steps, so much time to make two rings and then break it. So what was our goal in this field that if we can do a simultaneous ring formation as well as ring expansion, so we call it SRFRE. So, so in one step, we make the ring as well as we, we, we break the ring. And I, I thought of this uh, oxycope ring expansion, which basically break a sigma bond right here and make a new sigma bond. And we thought of utilizing our carbon chemistry. So we, we looked into literature whether this can be done or not, and 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 we also also attempted uh, some some reactions right here, and I there were some literature precedent for for this reaction, but I will just get into uh, right into the dive into the result. So we made this diazo in in two steps, got this uh, keto alcohol, and then there are three possibilities. It can just do the insertion reaction, it can do the insertion aldol number four, or it can do the insertion aldol and oxyco. And we were happy to report that basically in toluene reflux, you can get 68% yield of this medium sized ring. And uh, we basically try to, to synthesize a diverse uh, scaffold. And this paper was accepted literally in like seven days, the fastest acceptance. And, and we just submitted this to, this to organic letter, but I know a reviewer who told me, why didn't you submit this to Jax because, but, but I was in the middle of my NSF career uh, award. And this was really crucial to publish this result for by NSF career grant, uh, which generally comes. So, so, so this is why we got it fast. And maybe this was a mistake, but, but this chemistry is very powerful to make all these nine member rings. You can also make a 13 member ring in this. So I will dive into the, the mechanism here. And, and basically what is going on in this, that, that you take this, this, this here, uh, diazo compound, you make a metal carbene, you do a OH insertion followed by a L-dol, which is highly, highly stereoselective. So this aldol product forms in like greater than a 98% uh, diastereomeric uh, ratio. And then it undergoes a, a oxycope. The oxycope is much more facile here because you think about the sigma bond because there's OH right here in oxycope, but this ester is basically making it more weak because the double bond will come in conjugation. So when you have an electron drawing group, the oxycope are much faster. And then there's a ketoenol tautomerism to give the oxycycle this nine member ring. So everything works in, in literally one step. So again, Dr. Abdosans was really interested in this. I was presenting this in a Gordon conference. There was a student, uh, Jessica from Richmond Sarpong Group, who works at, at Dr. Abdosans. And generally, they were trying to make these, uh, these, these lactone, which was their initial hit, and convert them to this, uh, this ether because there was a metabolic stability problem. And we can easily make these diverse structures in, in one step. So we have submitted more than of 47 analogs to, to them for, for screening. So we are waiting for the results. And uh, then we were thinking that can we extend this to NH and there was a serendipity here that when my students were trying this, so if you have a protected uh, aniline here with benzyl, you can make a medium sized ring. But if you have a free NH2, you end up basically making a medium sized ring first, but that it undergoes an amine attack to the ketone and then elimination. So we have done some mechanistic studies to, to prove this, and this was a serendipity period, so we can make these quinoline structures also. And, and basically we are doing five, five transformation in a single step in, in one pot. This was highlighted by in Synfax by, by Pfizer, and, and we have also published like another paper in a, in a related chemistry, which was developed by, by student Nick Masaro, who won a uh, Robertson Research and Creativity Grant. So, so this was accepted uh, last year. So we have also access medium sized electron using this chemistry and one of the compound in this chemistry is a lead compound basically for our back-to-back -back, uh, project. And this is a, this is a inhibitor right here. 
so we are also screening all these compound with our with our collaborators so with this basically i will i will end my my talk here but with the some current uh, uh, stage what we are doing because we know that rhodium is very very expensive so we are trying to replace rhodium with with iron although we can use like less than 1 mole percent of rhodium but still uh, nsf uh, because of sustainability they are trying to fund projects which are using earth abundant metals so so iron is obviously the most abundant uh, metal in earth crust after aluminum 90 million times more abundant than rhodium but also the one more crucial thing that this is basically in drug substance cuz iron is found in our body so 1300 ppm is basically acceptable compared to less than 10 ppm for rhodium or or palladium or or other transition state metals so so we have some some result we are working with dr nicolas if you have heard of a nicolas reaction so dr nicolas is at our department he is a wonderful colleague so nicolas reaction we use cobalt chemistry so so you can obviously look it up in the nem reaction book uh, so we are having this collaboration with him and then this project was recently funded just last week actually uh, because of the the iron so so we we got some money on this also so so that's a, that's a good part uh, with this uh, basically i have already till now have graduated three students as dr uh, mal pointed out i got my tenure this year so i'm associate professor but we have develop uh, or we have basically uh, got a lot of money with graduate students so i encourage them to apply for fellowships 48000 with undergraduates my student was selected by american chemical society is 2019 cas future leaders program last year uh, and this girl is now working at department of of defense uh, and she also won the best thesis award at at, at ou so so then with this i would like to thank uh, uh, all of you and but also our collaborators uh, we got a wonderful set of collaborators right here this pharma company but also the funding agencies uh, american chemical society prf grant early career uh, award from national science foundation nida grant from nih o cast grant and 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 cobre uh, pilot money and and with this i would like to thank you all of you for for listening me and again uh, thank you to the organizing committee uh, for providing me the opportunity and i will be very happy to take any questions or suggestions you have for me because i am still a much more junior and still a still a young uh, young uh, young scientist you know and last thing for students because this is a college talk uh, we are looking forward for motivated phd students so if you are interested you can apply to ou and this year gre is waived off so that is a good news because of covid we are not uh, considering any gre score so you don't need to take gre if you are worried about gre don't take it we will just have a skype interview with this i will i'll end my talk and and i will be very happy to take questions or or suggestions i think dr malaj muted sir you are muted so please unmute your microphone can you hear me now yes, yes. Okay, okay. This seminar is open for discussion, and uh, let's see uh, what are the questions I've uh, given in the web, or anybody can also ask questions directly. Uh, uh, let's uh, give priority to the students uh, who are interested, or students or junior faculty members who are interested in asking questions to Indrajit. Ah, uh, we All have right. one, only one question in the chat box. Uh, okay. From Chandrima, from Chandrima Mollik, that what is euphoria? Okay. Uh, she uh, oh, can't okay. understand this. What is euphoria? Okay, so so let me let me briefly tell the euphoria is that when you you feel euphoric, or you can check some some English dictionary, but basically you feel really excited. So when you take a drug, you feel like top of the world. You think that you know you are a superhero. So this is what happens when you take take heroin. so you take a hero and you feel like a hero that you are a superman and once that after two or three hours this this effect goes away then again you get depressed you again want that compound and this is called euphoric behavior extremely happy so this is called chemical happiness so when you feel euphoric really you are extremely behavior. happy addictive, addictive behavior yeah addictive behavior this leads to and dysphoric is the opposite when you really yeah, feel yeah. sad and depressed okay I thought in IIT uh, there used to be a euphoria. 
there there used to be a program called yes, yes 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 yeah yes. okay there's a music band by Apollo yeah. Cell, you know. Okay. Uh, okay. Any other chemistry questions? If not, I'll ask a question. Let's see. Any 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 other questions, Sutapa? No, no, sir. You you may ask. Okay. Okay. Uh, Indujit, I'm just interested to know that uh, could you isolate your oxycope intermediate uh, during that uh, reaction, uh, carbon reaction? Yes, 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 sir. So we have we have done some mechanistic studies. So so you can basically stop it at the oxycope. If you do reaction in dichloromethane rather than toluene, then uh -huh. you can isolate it at at, at room okay. temperature. And oxycope generally oh, requires okay. temperature of maybe around eighty degrees Celsius to to reflux in toluene. Maybe more. Maybe faster. even more. Yes. Okay. Oh, okay. And uh, uh, your oxycope uh, takes place at room temperature or just slightly above room temperature. So oxycope what takes place generally the best yield we get in DCM reflux, or it can like at forty degrees see. Celsius. Uh, but generally at room temperature also it it works. But we are competing oh, okay. with the with the insertion reaction. So if you increase the temperature a little bit to forty degrees Celsius, then you get exclusively aldol, insertion aldol. So I so see. so oxycope intermediate. Okay. Oh, okay. Good. So it's good. It's a very good work though. And uh, one more thing. Uh, see, the, see well, your the reactions with the acetylene co containing the compound. Uh, yes. You have got a Konya in reaction. Yes, that is also a very low temperature reaction or high temperature reaction. So, so in that reaction can work at at room temperature as well as actually I didn't uh, show the data because that is unpublished data. But actually, we can yes. do it in NH selectively uh, in NH selected transformation. We haven't published that, but. This reaction can oh, go even at negative see. negative forty degrees Celsius with with high EE. Oh, that's, that's, I so, see. That's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think just because I wasn't sure, uh, generally that is unpublished data, so I removed that data from my my talk. But okay. but but we can do it rhodium gold dual a uh, combination at zero degrees Celsius. Uh, but if you lower down temperature to negative forty, we get high EE. Oh, that's that's great. Oh, so. So it's not published yet. No, we haven't. Uh, we haven't published it because I was busy okay. in my my tenure, and we okay. got like three students were graduated. So I'm looking for obviously a postdoc, and you know we just got some money. Okay. So I'm looking also for a postdoc as well as okay. some motivated PhD students. If if someone is interested, they can even okay. get a RA if they if they come here. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. So, why why did you send your advertisement to IIT Kharagpur? You know. Okay, uh, I will. I will. <laughs> And now, and Devas is Ray is the head of the department. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, okay. Sir, uh, another uh, question uh, we have, sir. Another question we have. Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, Doctor Tarun Mistri, Doctor Tarun Mistri, ask a question. What is the main reason for high selectivity of colibolide uh, with respect to other analog? Okay. Uh, if I understand the question, let me repeat that. That what is the what is the main reason for the colibrate selectivity compared to other compounds or other analogs? So, so this is a, this is a good question. And basically, yeah. basically, you know, whenever you get you get selectivity in a compound, uh, that has to do with the with the binding structure. So you have to look at the the. So still, the I cannot answer this because the co-crystal structure is not known. So we are trying to get a co-crystal structure of colibride with the opioid receptor, but GPCR proteins are very very difficult to crystallize. But based on computational modeling, uh, we can we can we can we can answer it. But again, computational is not fully reliable. Computational is just a guide. So this is a good question, but uh, unfortunately, I I don't have a good answer right now. But this terpenolactone. Uh, moiety is found to be essential actually, and then the, the the compound which which have that motif. But again, this this is a this is a good question. We don't have a good answer right now. Okay. Any other question? No, there is no okay. question in chat box. Okay. There are no questions. Then we should give big hand to Dr. Indraji Sharma. And uh, I, I really appreciate your blending of uh, organic chemistry and chemical biology in your talk. And uh, please uh, go forward for 
more interesting results. Uh, with these few oh, words, sure. I, uh, I pass on the uh, uh, seminar to uh, Sudhapa. Okay. Thank you, Indrajit, for your very nice and lucid talk. And okay. Thank you very much. Also, okay. It is now uh, too uh, late for you. Yes, uh, yes. So I will, I will be leaving. And again, thank you, everyone. Uh, and 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 you know, again, good luck to students. And and if you have any question, anything you want to know about US, about the the the, the admission process or anything, feel free to contact me. And I will be very happy to answer. You know. Okay. Then I have a question. Then I have a question. Okay. Uh, did you, your uh, GRE waving is it yes. ap applicable to chemistry or all disciplines? Uh, generally, at least we just made a decision last week, but I think that that most of the departments are are going to do that at least at our okay. university. But but okay. there are almost hundred other universities in US who have signed the petition to waive up the GRE. I see. So, okay. so it's a university Thank initiative. You. So this is applicable to almost I think, but. Uh, I can send you the list, but almost 100 different universities have signed, including MIT, Harvard, and, 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 and other big schools. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you, Indraji. Have a nice time. Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you and good night for you. Okay. okay. Bye. Okay. Uh, should we continue, Sutupa? Uh... Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please. Okay. So we'll, uh, we'll go for the next speaker. We'll go for the next speaker. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, but Professor Pine okay, is there. Okay. Pine is here. Oh, okay. 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 Uh, let him come. Yes, sir. He is. He has, he has joined. He has joined already. But I don't see him though. I'm there. I'm there, sir. Okay. Now I see. Now I see. Hello. Hello. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, sir. How are you? Hello. Uh, Good morning, all right. What about you? Yeah, fine. Great to see you again. Oh, oh sure, sure, sure. No, I like to see you quite, again. Quite, what, quite, uh, quite often we quite often we see each other only on webinar, right? <laughs> right, right. That's uh, good because yes, you have been doing so good, you know. And uh, there are very few uh, who are so good, doing so good. Any case, I think uh, I should introduce you to the audience before we speak. I think uh, Professor Pine, I think all of you have seen him, but at our being all uh, you are seeing uh, in the screen. And uh, now he's a professor at the Indian Institute, uh, sorry, Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science. Science. And uh, he's an ex student of IIT Kharagpur. He did his master's degree in chemistry in 1988 uh, from IIT Kharagpur. And then uh, he moved to Germany. For his graduate studies at 1998. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, thanks. Sorry, sorry. Oh, okay. I'm making you older than by 10 years. Okay. <laughs> yes. There is no harm to be old. Right. Because I'm getting old, right? Okay. So, and he moved to Germany and for his PhD degree at the Max Planck Institute of Bioelectronic Chemistry. And he received his PhD in 2003. And after that, he spent three years at the University of Minnesota, USA, for his postdoctoral research. Finally, he came to India, back, came back to India, and now he is at ISCS, popularly known as Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science. And uh, he is interested in uh, biomimetic chemistry of oxidative transformations, um, especially related to inorganic ox oxidations. Uh, you know, or, no, I should not say inorganic oxidation. Uh, oxi in general, by you know, inorganic chemistry, and uh, I am so happy that Professor Pine regularly publishes his angiomatic chemistry, which is a rare fit in the scientific community from India. And I don't know how, how many he has published in the last five years, but uh, when I was active, I used to continuously uh, see his publications in angiomatic semi. Uh, I on how many in recent years? Uh, okay, uh, maybe. Uh, maybe during your talk, you'll be uh, focusing on those work. And with this uh, few words, I request uh, Professor Pine to uh, deliver his lecture.
can you all see my presentation slide? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So a uh, good morning to all of you. Um, it's really a great pleasure to be here again. Uh, sorry. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for your kind words. It's always a pleasure, whatever I learned from IIT Kharagpur and uh, subsequently during my PhD and postdoc, I'm trying my level best to keep up with that. And uh, uh, and I, I thank the organizer for having me here. So today what I'm going to talk uh, on something not really a primary research area that my group is interested in, but considering the participation of students, faculty members, as well as the researchers in this particular webinar, I picked up a topic which is quite different. As you can see from this particular uh, slide, the title is something called Establishing Physical Oxidation States in Metal Complexes of Ligands with Open Shell Electron Configuration. There is a quite confusion when I mean, why this particular topic I'm interested in. There is a, if you go to the inorganic chemistry textbooks, it's quite confusing regarding the oxidation state in metals in different metal complexes. Particularly when you have ligands with a open shell electronic configuration. When you have a closed cell electronic configuration of the ligand, there is absolutely no problem. But the problem arises with open shell electronic configuration. And I'm quite surprised that in spite of the great development in this particular area for last 20 years or so, this particular topic has not yet find any place in an organic chemistry textbook, particularly coordination chemistry. So for the next 35 minutes or so, I'll take you through the development of this particular area of coordination chemistry, where it ended, and from where this particular understanding started. So this is something like understanding oxidation states. So let us see what does that mean. Let me take you to the coordination theory postulated by Alfred Warner, the father of coordination chemistry, back in 1893. Werner proposed that there could be two type of valences for metal complexes, the primary valence and a secondary valence. And you all know that the primary valence is a ionizable valence, what sometime or at that time it was termed as oxidation state of the metal. And secondary valence is something like the coordination number and this coordination number, depending on the metal ion, it has certain value. And this balance, particularly the secondary balance, must always be satisfied. For example, I picked up this particular uh, cartoon from the original paper of Alfred Werner, which was published in 1893, which was a revolutionary work. And it was published in Zeitschrift for an Organische Chemie, where he proposed that for metal ammonia compound, particularly for cobalt ammonia compound, where cobalt can have six groups surrounded by, you know, six ammonia groups surrounding cobalt ion. And you can have six ammonia, or you can have five ammonia, one halide in the second coordination sphere, four ammonia, two halide, or three ammonia, three halide. But in all these places, you see the primary, the secondary valence is six in all these cases. And you know that you have three ionizable chloride here, you have two ionizable chloride, you have one ionizable chloride, and there is no ionizable chloride. And there is no confusion about the oxidation state of cobalt in all these complexes. And you can, or whatever way we learn, is that you can unambiguously assign the oxidation state of cobalt in this particular compound. So the formal oxidation state in these compounds for cobalt is plus three. So now here we define what is the formal oxidation state. The formal oxidation state is the charge remaining on the metal after all ligands have been removed in their normal closed shell configuration. 
that is along with their electron pair. So if I take out all six ammonia, each ammonia contains two lone pair electron or like one lone pair electron, so two electrons. And if I take out everything, what you are left is with a cobalt three. So the oxidation state of cobalt in this particular case or formal oxidation state is plus three. And similarly, there is another oxidation state, which as I said at the beginning of my talk, which is quite often ignored in the textbook is called physical or spectroscopic oxidation state. And what is that? That is the oxidation state of the metal ion, which is determined from its known electronic configuration. If this is a cobalt three plus, and if this is a low spin compound, you basically have six electron in the D orbitals. If it's a low spin, this would be diamagnetic. And considering all these factors, we can call that it's physical or spectroscopic oxidation state, basically, which are derived from different spectroscopic tools, like electronic spectroscopy, like nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, EPR spectroscopy where applicable, or magnetic study, all these physical techniques allowed the determination of physical or spectroscopic oxidation state. So for this compound, the formal and physical oxidation state of cobalt, they are same, that is plus three. But this is not necessarily the case in a large number of compounds. And the best example is, I would tell you, the oxyhemoglobin. As you look at the molecular orbital of O2, you have two unpaired electrons in the antibonding molecular orbitals. So oxygen can pick off one, two, three, and four. So up to four electron oxygen can pick off and oxygen can be reduced by four electron to water. But if I consider the sequential reduction of oxygen, the first electron will go there that will left one unpaired electron on oxygen that is called superoxide. If two electrons go there, so each of the pi antibonding molecular orbitals now will be filled, that is called peroxide. And if you just inject two more electron in the sigma star, then there will be no bond order. That means your bond order will be zero which indicates that OO bond gets cleaved. But that is not the point here. Point here is the oxyhemoglobin, where you have still OO bond intact. And here you see that in the heme group, oxygen binds to the iron center. But what is the oxidation state of iron? And what is the state of oxygen? Is it a normal oxygen, O2 dioxygen? Is it a superoxide or this is a peroxide. So a lot of biochemical studies and eventually spectroscopic studies, DFT calculations, and simple synthetic compounds allowed understanding of the physical oxidation state of iron in this compound. Why? Because oxygen itself can show variable oxidation state. So therefore, in situation like this, it's quite difficult to unambiguously assign the oxidation state of the metal center. So here, the synthetic oxyheme species, if I just write it that I have a porphyrin, so I have, if I have a porphyrin oxygen here, I can represent this oxyheme species as iron could be in plus two oxidation state, low spin. That means all the electron on the metal center are paired up and it's a low spin, so S is equal to zero. And oxygen is singlet. That means the unpaired electron in the antibonding orbitals are paired up. So that will give rise to a diamagnetic species, iron oxygen adduct. So is this the species in oxygen? Or it can be a formal electron transfer from iron center to the antibonding molecular orbital of oxygen. Then it can form an iron-3 superoxide. If it is an iron three and a low spin, your, there is one unpaired electron, so your S is equal to half. 
And if it is a superoxide, you have one unpaired electron on oxygen and both are, you know, half spin. Similarly, it can be an iron two and then oxygen can have two unpaired electron or it can be a triplet oxygen also. So you can consider that this would be an S equal to one iron two and S equal to one oxygen. But the compound is diamagnetic in nature. How can we explain that? And eventually, a lot of spectroscopic studies like MOS power spectroscopy, resonance Raman spectroscopy, and other DFT calculations indicated that actual species is not an iron 2 oxygen adduct, neither it's an iron 2 a peroxide species, it is actually an iron 3 superoxo species. So, how do we know that this is a diamagnetic? So if you have one unpaired electron on the iron center and another unpaired electron on oxygen, these two unpaired electrons couple with each other antiferromagnetically, giving rise to a diamagnetic ground state S is equal to zero. So one up spin and another down spin making it a diamagnetic system. So this is a clear indication of different valence state of oxygen, which sometimes makes it difficult to assign the oxidation state of iron just based on simple one or two spectroscopic tools or even just single crystal structure. Because quite often we rely single crystal structure and from the single crystal structure, we say that this is the oxidation state of the metal ion. But this is not the case. And I will take you, you through such examples where we have shown and other groups have shown that this is not the case always and assigning physical oxidation state remains a matter of great deal. Another example is a brown ring compound. You all know this thing for the undergraduate laboratory of the test of nitrate, where you use an iron salt and you use nitric acid, sulfuric acid, and eventually it gives rise to a brown ring. And then you say, oh, okay, this is the function I put present in that. So if the compound which is, in the, which is formed in the brown ring was formulated long, long ago that this is nothing but penta aqua nitroso iron two iron species, sorry. Now, if this is the case, I can write it in many different way because if you look at the molecular orbital, just like carb oxygen, your NO is nothing, but you have one unpaired electron in the antibonding molecular orbital. So one electron less than O2 molecule. So your NO can have a NO dot. It can give up one electron. It can form NO plus. It can receive one electron. It can form NO minus. So what is the exact formulation of the brown ring compound? Is that an iron one pentaquo NO plus species? Or is that an iron two pentaquo NO radical species? Or that's an iron three pentaquo NO minus species? A lot of debate took place in the last, I don't know how many years, maybe for a century or so. And only, as I said, understanding on this behavior of ligand and metal to assign the formal oxidation state of metal center and also for the ligand, where ligand can exist in variable redox state, that understanding only came in last 20 years or so. So only in 2002, based on a spectroscopic studies, kinetic studies, it has now been established that this is an iron three pentaquo NO minus species. And all of you know that in a field of notation, that is the reason why the oxidation state of metal or NO compounds are never said. It is said like that, how many electrons are there for Fe NO system? So this certainly indicates the number of unpaired electron for Fe NO species. But exact oxidation state requires a lot of spectroscopic studies and therefore assigning physical oxidation state is not always a very straightforward. Coming to this one now, I just draw a compound here which was synthesized back in 1991. And that time, you know, there was not much development in this area, although people started thinking that there must be something wrong 
about the assigning the physical oxidation state on many compounds because the ligands also show the variable redox state. Uh, back in 1960s, uh, when people first realized this, but that time there was not much technical tool to uh, prove the actual oxidation state of the metal ion and also the oxidation state of ligands. Now look at this compound. If I just go by Wagner's coordination principle, you have this X and Y could be oxygen, sulfur, NH, or they could be a combination of them. So they're all an ionic charge. And this phosphine ligand or substituted phosphines, if I considering all, this is a neutral compound, as I said, was synthesized in 1991. And that time, this research group assigned the oxidation state of the iron at that time as all of you will assign based on Wagner's coordination principle. What is that? Plus four. Because you have one negative charge, two negative charge, three negative charge, and four negative charge. So that would make it a plus four oxidation state because the whole compound is neutral. And after that, for 10 years or so, nobody really thought about it. And then people started thinking, what is actually, is this the oxidation state of iron here plus four? This is a paramagnetic compound with a spin ground state is equal to one. So I'll take up this particular topic a little later, but let us see that these kind of ligands were assigning oxidation state of the metal when those ligands coordinate to the metal center remain a matter of debate or sometimes not very easy to assign. These ligands are called non-innocent ligands. So the innocent ligand like ammonia, which cannot show variable oxidation state because I cannot have an ammonia dot, but I can have oxygen where oxygen can have O2, O2 superoxide, O2 peroxide, or just example I have shown with nitric oxide, which can have NO dot, NO plus, NO minus. Similarly, the ligands that can show variable oxidation state or variable redox states, something like catechol, all of you know that catechol can be oxidized by two electron to orthoquinone, one, two catechol. So your catechol can be converted two electron to quinone, but if I oxidize this particular species by one electron, what will happen? There will be a radical species which will be on this uh, catecholate unit. But that case, this is neither a catecholate nor a quinone, but it's bit in between. So it's a half quinone. That's why this is called a semi-quinone. So you have now three different redox states. So when such kind of ligands remain coordinated, <laughs> You can have a metal in N plus two oxidation state with neutral ligand, or you can have, or sorry, not neutral, dianionic ligand. You can have a monoanionic ligand with a radical, but your metal center then can have N plus one oxidation state, or your metal can have M N oxidate plus oxidation state, but your ligand will be purely neutral. So these three possibilities are there how can we delineate the possibilities depending on the nature of metal ion and come to a conclusion about the physical oxidation state of a compound when these ligands are coordinated to metal center. Pierpont and others, as I mentioned, have done a lot of work on catecholate system for, you know, since late 80s to until the, the beginning of this century, where they have shown, Pierpont's group and others have shown that single crystal X-ray diffraction could be a useful tool to delineate or to differentiate between the different species when they remain coordinated to metal center. For example, if catecholate remains coordinated to a metal center, this carbon oxygen bond will be carbon oxygen single bond because it's a catecholate and this should be an aromatic ring. So you have a delocalization and therefore there is not much difference of the carbon carbon bonds. 
1.41, 1.39, when you consider the error of plus minus 0 0.01 angstrom, you basically have an equal carbon-carbon bonds. And this carbon-oxygen bond is 1.34 angstrom. Whereas, if catechol remains there in its true electron oxidized form, that is quinone or benzoquinone, the carbon oxygen bond will be 1.22. Now, the aromaticity here is not a delocalized one. You now have an alternative dubs, you know, single bond, double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond, and then this will also be a single bond. So carbon oxygen double bond gets reduced from 1.34 to 1.22, typical of a carbon oxygen double bond. And you have now a quinonoid structure where you have a long, short, long, short, long bond distance. What about semiquinone, the intermediate system? The bond distances would be in between. So the carbon oxygen bond would be 1.30, whereas you see here that there is now also a similar type of quinonoid structure, or we call it a quinonoid distortion with long, short, long, short, long. So that means you can unambiguously shape from the crystal structure whether your catecholate unit remains in dianionic form or oxidized form within its neutral benzoquinone, or it's a monoanionic semiquinone with a metal bound semiquinone radical. So we wanted to probe this one. As I said, this is not uh, my uh, primary interest of research, but somehow sometimes our students are, get you know, interested in this. And I will show you a couple of results of our study where most of the works were done by my master students. So this is some work which where one of my master students started. Uh, we wanted to probe the non-inutions of catechol and orthoamino phenols where your X is equal to NH. That means amino phenol and catechol. And I have already shown that they can exist in variable redox state from its dianionic to monoanionic semiquinone and also to its quinone or immunobenzoquinone in case of amino phenol. And we used this particular ligand, which is tris thiopyridyl methyl ligand, where you have an iron carbon bonds. The reason was that this iron carbon bonds is so strong that this makes the iron center low spin. So we wanted to not to go to in a complicated high spin system where you really need other tools for characterization. And you now have a labile ligand XX where this OX or bidentate ligand can go and bind and therefore one can prove the redox state of this unit. So while doing that, we first isolated the iron to acetonitrile compound of this ligand. And then this was allowed to react with ditertiary butyl catechol uh, in the presence of a base in acetonitrile. And it forms two isomer, quite similar, not much different. And here you see that this is an iron three compound because this eventually forms an iron three compound even in the trace amount of oxygen in spite of a great effort to isolate the corresponding iron two catecholate compound. So this forms an iron three catecholate compound. And here in this case, just trust me that I have not shown you the CC bonds, but this is purely an aromatic ring and the carbon oxygen bonds are a carbon oxygen single bond. So this is an iron three catecholate unit. This compound, when treated with ferrocenium hexafluorophosphate and with one electron oxidizing agent, which can pick up one electron, where it can ex, ex, you know, uh, take the electron? Will it take electron from iron center? So iron center will get oxidized to iron four or DBC, that means catechol unit will get oxidized. And here you see the optical spectral pattern. This is a catecholate unit, a typical of uh, catecholate to iron three charge transfer, which appears in the region of between 600 and 800 nanometer. But as soon as it is, it reacts with ferrocenium hexafluorophosphate, a strong charge transfer band comes here in the near IR region at around uh, 1100 nanometer. And uh, 
this master student of mine, Partho, was smart enough and he could crystallize the final compound. So he got a compound, a very similar structure of the iron three catecholate. But now, if you just look at this particular unit, that means the unit derived from catechol, and if we look at the carbon oxygen bond, 1.27, 1.29, much lower than carbon oxygen single bond, but it's not purely a 1.2, which is expected for a quinone system. So, and also you, in the aromatic ring, what we found is that an alternative double bond and single bond and a quinonoid distortion is present and therefore we assign this compound as an iron three semi quinone species, not an iron four species. And similarly, we also isolated the amino phenolate compound instead of oxygen. Now you have an NH2, but in this case, we were lucky enough to isolate the iron to amino phenolate compound. This, when reacts with oxygen, it now changes its spectral feature. Again, shows a strong charge transfer band here in the 700 nanometer. And this is at room temperature. So now in room temperature, it reacts with oxygen. Iron center can go to iron three, or you can have iron two semiquinone, you can have iron three immunosemiquinone. But for the latter, that means iron three immunosemiquinone, you need to do two electron oxidation. So what happens? Let us see at what happens at low temperature. So finally, when we do this reaction at room temperature, we could isolate the final compound, which is a diamagnetic compound. That means my compound does not have any spin left. And this is the crystal structure of the final compound after reaction with oxygen at room temperature. And from the crystal structure and the bond distances as shown here, you see that this is actually contains a radical species with a quinonoid distortion. And therefore this is an iron three immuno semi quinone species, just like a quinone species from catechol I have shown you a couple of minutes ago. So that means my iron two compound here has undergone two electron oxidation, oxidized as well as the amino phenolate unit got oxidized. So how do we know that this is a stepwise process or this is just a, you know, a single step process? At room temperature, it happens very fast. But then we wanted to see what happened. The reaction. So lowering the temperature to minus 20 degrees Celsius, we see initially a charge transfer band, this one at 700 and at 9,000, uh, sorry, about uh, 1,000 nanometer increases. And then subsequently, this band decays, as you can see here, that uh, this, this particular band decays. And this one, which was forming, now increases rapidly and this final spectrum of this one matches with the optical spectrum of the semi quinone species. So what is the intermediate species? When we analyze the intermediate species by EPR spectroscopy, EPR spectroscopy shows a kind of an axial signal of a low spin iron three compound. So first my iron center is getting oxidized in the first step. And in the subsequent step, a further oxidation takes place not on the iron center, but on the amino phenolate unit, leading to the formation of immuno semiquinone species. So this is the overall redox behavior that this iron to amino phenolate species react with oxygen to form an iron three amino phenolate species. And this one further reacts to form an iron three immuno semiquinone species as this one. This one can be electrochemically reduced here or using sodium tetrathionate, you can reduce the iron three center to iron two center and for the reaction with oxygen, I can go back and forth. So this was something we got some understanding on this system. Similarly, um, for when instead of one amine and one oxygen, now if you have a two amines, they are also single crystal X-ray diffraction proved to be quite useful. And this was shown back in 2003. 
uh, by, uh, by one uh, group member from my PhD group. And they have shown that this also contains a uh, radical ligand in this particular uh, system. Now come back to the war problem where we started with, that is benzene dithiolene system. So it is more like a catechol. So there should not be much problem here also, just because this can also undergo one electron oxidation to form an open shell monoanionic radical species. This can further oxidation, oxidize to get, you know, a quinone type dithione species, or they can have a radical radical species and this can form, but normally they are neutral. So we can discard that possibility that this, these two are not exist in the molecule that in 1991 this one what is the oxidation state of iron here this compound let me now tell you was synthesized from an iron 3 precursor of a six coordinate compound and this is an iron 3 low spin is equal to half absolutely no problem but if you look at the crystal structure of this compound you see the carbon sulfur bond is 1.758 and when this one was oxidized by one electron, which forms this compound with S equal to one spin ground state, your carbon sulfur bond still is 1.759. So there is not much difference. How can we differentiate then from the single crystal X-ray diffraction? And that is the reason why this particular group, when they published this work in 1991, reported that this is an iron four oxidation state. Because the CS bonds are equivalent and there was no quinonoid distortion upon oxidation. So where oxidation took place? So subsequently, only in 2003, one of uh, my friend, when we were doing PhD, he worked on this system and he found that this is, if this is an iron four, you have S equal to one because of the low spin, now you have to unpaired electron. I can now write it also like this, that it can be an iron three, but there could be a ligand centric radical because this is more like an open shell electronic configuration. So if it is an iron three, this that would be three unpaired electron, uh, like with this electronic configuration, three unpaired electron, one in dx, y, d, y, dx, z, y, z, and dz square, and you have one unpaired electron here. So if this one is anti-parallel to the electrons on the metal center, these two will be coupled anti-ferromagnetically, leading to just like this. So sometimes it's really, really difficult whether it's an iron four or it's an iron three. But after much, uh, you know, work on this uh, by doing uh, X-ray absorption spectroscopy, MOS power spectroscopy their time temperature dependent EPR spectroscopy, so many other spectroscopic tools, they finally concluded that this is an iron three compound, not an iron four. Just from the Werner's coordination principle that I started with, we should not be just uh, biased with, and this is an iron three uh, ligand centric radical. But the problem here in this case is different. As I have shown you, told you, that the single crystal structure of the final compound will not be able to tell anything because of the spin orbit coupling and also the carbon sulfur bond and carbon carbon bond and no presence of quinoidoia distortion, single crystal is not a useful tool. And therefore, I would always say this, and I always say this when I talk with students, when they just come up with some spectroscopic data and they become very excited, I always say, what are the other data? Because it is not a single spectroscopic tool or single spectral data can tell the identity of a compound. You need to work on separate tools, analyze the data, and then only come to a conclusion what it actually be. Otherwise, it will eventually lead you confusion and if we publish that work in literature, that mistake will always remain. So inspired by this particular thing, we thought of that when we have a heavy metal, 
like chalcogenides, which have a very strong zero, you know, spin orbit coupling, and single crystal data may not be always useful. How can we develop an understanding about the oxidation state of metal center? Is that always very easy to do? So, with that objective, I gave this project to one of my master students back in 2016. And then in, uh, he came up with an interesting observation and that I will share with you in the last part of my talk, where the nickel complexes of ligands derived from orthohydroxyphenyl dichalcogenide, where A and B are either oxygen or sulfur or oxygen or selenium. So we picked up this ligand where your XX could be sulfur or selenium. So diselenium, selenophenol kind of things. And why this particular ligand we picked up? Because when this compound reacts with a metal salt, the XX bond is cleaved reductively. If this bonds reductively cleaved, where the electron comes from, the electron should come from the metal center. And then what eventually forms is this kind of ligand in its anionic form, and then it will form a metal complex. So this ligand, when treated with nickel-2 in the presence of a base just to deprotonate the phenols and methanol, it forms beautiful, the ligand forms beautiful nickel complexes depending on what is the X. X is sulfur or selenium, and it forms a monoanionic nickel compound with almost square planar geometry. This is the selenophenol compound, as you can see here, that one oxygen and one selenium. Two such ligands are there, and this is a monoanionic. So now again, let us go back to Wagner's coordination principle. This is monoanionic. So if this is a negative charge, this is a negative charge, this is a, I have four negative charge. An overall charge of the metal complex is negative, one negative. So what is the oxidation state of nickel? Just by simple Wagner's theory, I will say the oxidation state is nickel in plus three. Is it so? Okay, let us see. So the structure clearly says that, okay, you have two ligand and uh, ESI mass spectrometry shows an ion peak in ESI you know, negative mode. 625.06 with expected isotope distribution pattern. Beautiful because you have two selenium, so you have a fantastic isotope distribution pattern. Unambiguously suggests the composition of the complex, not the oxidation state. When this compound was subjected to EPR spectroscopy, the EPR spectrum shows a kind of an anisotropic EPR signal that suggests that this is S equal to half species. And Definitely, this says that this anisotropy is more or less like a nickel three kind of things. Okay, could be. And you see, you have a selenium hyperfines also because is selenium as I equal to half nuclear spin half. So you have a three line hyperfine on the EP, on the EPR signal, and this says that this is quite an isotropic system. So I can always say based on these two data, I have already pretty large amount of data on this. I have mass spectrometry, I have crystal structure, I have EPR spectroscopy. Based on that, I can always say, oh, this is nickel-3. But when we speak, so this is the same for, as you can see, for the sulfur analogs, not much different. Here again, the ESI mass spectrum and the EPR spectrum shows that this is an isotropic as well, not much different from the selenium system, except the anisotropy, because in case of selenium, you have much more uh, spin orbit coupling. So therefore, your G value in the previous case is much higher. You see 2.26, 2.08, and 2.03. But in this case, it's a 2.18, 2.03, and 2.01. So in the selenium system, it's much more anisotropic because of the you have more spin orbit coupling in case of selenium. So this is this says that okay, this could be a nickel three compound. But interestingly, when we collected the electronic spectra of those two compounds. Both of them show very strong charge transfer transition in the near IR region, around 1100 nanometer. And the extinction coefficient, as you can see here, 15,000, not typical of a single metal to ligand charge transfer transition or intraligand charge transfer transition. This is typical of something like called 
intervalence charge transfer transitions. And this happens like in a Robin Day classification. This is a class three of mixed balance compound where ligand to ligand charge transfer transition takes place. So what does it mean? It does mean that if one of the ligand is electron rich in the compound and another ligand is electron deficient, then the HOMO of this ligand transfer electron to the LUMO of this ligand, giving rise to such strong charge transfer transition. Now, this is pretty confusing. If this is so, one ligand has to be oxidized form, then only this would be electron deficient. So if one ligand is oxidized, one ligand is in its new normal form, the metal center cannot be in plus three state. It is more likely that this could be a plus two state. So the EPR spectroscopy result, single crystal diffraction result, and now the electronic spectral data are completely you know, uh, orthogonal. I would not say orthogonal, but they are somehow, uh, uh, they, 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 they lead to a completely different conclusion. As I said, there is no way of coming to a conclusion based on this. We need to understand the system more. We need to understand the electronic structure of the compounds in details. So what, could the, what are the different possibilities? The different possibilities include that I can have a nickel in plus three oxidation state to anionic, a dianionic ligand. So this is one possibility. Or I can have a nickel to one ligand oxidized, one ligand in its normal form. Or there could be both the ligands are in oxidized form. So nickel can be in plus one oxidation state. Now from the electronic spectroscopy, from the single crystal data, I can just discard the possibility C. But as I have told you, EPR spectroscopy and single crystal X-ray structure suggest it could be A, whereas electronic spectroscopy is indicative of, not exactly confirm, indicating of that this could be B. So which one is correct? Then we wanted to see what could be the actual oxidation state of nickels. We have to take some spectroscopic tools which can only see nickel center, which will not see any other side of the complex. So we studied X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. And X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy suggests that you have this uh, nickel signal, which is derived from 2p3, 2p3 half at about 855 8 electron volt, along with a satellite peak here. This satellite peak is not observed if it is just a square planar compound. But if it is this one along with this one, if you observe, then along with this 2p half is a possibility that this is could be a nickel 2 compound. So this there is a possibility that from XPS suggests that nickel center is in plus 2 oxidation state. Now we wanted to see, so now there is a confusion. Electronic spectroscopy and XPS suggests it's a nickel 2. EPR suggest could be a nickel 3. So we wanted to see what is the electrochemistry of this compound. This compound can undergo one electron reduction, quasi reversible, and quasi reversible one electron oxidation both for both the compounds. Then we wanted to see what happens when we reduce or oxidize the compound. If we reduce the compound by one electron using cobaltosine, so it will inject an electron to the metal compound and you see the charge transfer transition slowly decays and eventually it shows a featureless optical spectrum. So that means when I'm injecting the electron, the electron is going to a ligand, not the metal. And the electron deficient ligand now become normalized. So two ligands now becoming similar and therefore the intervalent charge transfer transition diminishes. Similar situation is observed in case of complex two. So what we can see here that the nickel two comp nickel compound here can be one electron oxidized or it can be sorry reduced or it can be one electron oxidized. And in both the cases, the intervalent charge transfer transition upon oxidation as well as upon reduction, the intervalent charge transfer transition diminishes. Clearly suggest that in the original compound, nickel is a more like plus two oxidation state and ligand has some 
oxidation level. That means it is some form of the oxidation state. Then we found out that this is a delocalized system. And the DFT calculations indicated that the homos are highly delocalized. And because of the high spin orbit coupling, there is a large orbital contribution of the hetero atom like sulfur or selenium and the aromatic ring. And a large amount of contribution of a nickel center to the total spin density, which accounts for the anisotropic EPR signal. That means even if nickel is elect total electron density, because I have one unpaired electron, and out of that unpaired electron, one unpaired electron resides only 37% time or 36, 37% time on the metal center. And rest of the time, or I would say electron density wise, it is on the ligand. So it is completely delocalized. It is neither on this one nor on the metal. It is completely delocalized. And in that form, you see the optical spectral pattern. Nickel, you can see a delocalized redox state, both for nickel as well as for ligand. But in a formal sense, we can say that this is a nickel two compound with semi one ligand in its oxidized semi quinone form, another ligands in its neutral, sorry, in its dianionic form. And therefore, we picked up option B as uh, the formal or spectroscopic oxidation state of the compound. It's a nickel two semi quinone compound. So, from this particular things, we wanted to tell you that as I wanted to share with you that this is really a difficult job when you deal with metal complexes of ligands with open cell electronic configuration where ligand can show variable oxidation state. Their establishing oxidation state of the metal center is not easy based on simple Warner's coordination principle. And you are re required to study the system in depth using different spectroscopic and analytical tools. And then only you can say how the system behaves and what is the oxidation state of the metal ion. And these particular systems play important role in biology, which I, I could not touch upon, uh, which I'm particularly interested in. And so here, what ends actually our research starts, understanding this kind of ligands in biological system. So synthesizing such kind of redox non-innocent ligands and their role in biological systems, we want to try to study their implication in biological system using simple synthetic compounds. So in this particular case, I show you where is the electron. Electron is not anywhere, but it's a fully delocalized. So this is precisely what I wanted to share with you. Uh, before I end, I must thank uh, my co-workers. So Partho, when he was my master student, subsequently he did his PhD with me. Uh, he started the first part of the work. He did some work there during his master's project, but yeah, during his post PhD work, he did something different. And then uh, uh, Sridhar Banerjee, who had just submitted his PhD thesis, he was also a master student uh, in my group who did the nickel work, the last part as his master's project. And uh, he got uh, a small publication from there. So this is something really interesting and a curiosity driven work a master students uh, ventured into and got some interesting aspect of it. And I thank them for their hard work. I also thank all my group members for their contribution, a beautiful group. Uh, and I am really very happy with uh, their uh, contribution to my group. I thank the funding agency, Department of Science and Technology, Indian National Science Academy, Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, Swedish Research Council. Finally, I thank you for your attention and I'll be very happy to pick up questions and comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you participants. And uh, I think Dr. Pai will be Sir. Yes. Yes. yes uh, there are two questions in the chat box. Yes. Uh, first, first one is uh, how does quinoid distortion give us 
the proof of iron four oxidation state. Uh, the quinonoid distortion does not tell anything about the oxidation state. The quinonoid distortion tells that it is as the red ligand is oxidized by one electron. So this is a semi-quinone radical. So if I have a semi-quinone radical, ligand is already one electron oxidized. So metal cannot be in a higher oxidation state. That means plus four. So metal has to be in plus three oxidation state. So metal oxidation state and ligand oxidation state now should be compared together in order to understand the electronic structure of the whole compound. Thank you. So as you can see, as you can, as I have told you that in case of heavy metal containing like chalcogenides containing system, single crystal data is not useful tool. Quite often you will see uh, mistakes in literature and I can cite you in number of literatures where uh, just based on single crystal people have uh, predicted the oxidation state of metal center and which are definitely wrong. I'm not saying that the authors have made anything wrong. Their interpretation is wrong. The data is perfectly all right. Right. So based on the new understanding, those data or those signs should be relooked. That's why precisely what I wanted to say. And this particular thing is so important. You know, something that I wanted to tell particularly to the students that why this particular topic has not yet find any place in inorganic chemistry textbooks that ligand can also behave non innocently and therefore establishing oxidation state of metal unambiguously is not very easy in a compounds where ligand can show variable oxidation states. Okay, sir. Go for the next uh, and another yes, question is from Rakesh Mondol. Whether yes. redox active term is identical with the term non-innocent? Uh, that's a very interesting point. I mean, uh, whoever has asked this question is really, really interesting because uh, non-innocent may not necessarily, non-innocent the word says, it's not innocent, right? So you can say that sometimes it happens that some ligands can exist even in their tautomeric form. Like if you take one to diketone, one to diketone can bind to a metal center depending on the Lewis acidity in its diketone form or keto in all tautomeric form, right? That is also a non-innocent, but you cannot call it a redox non-innocent because there is no redox process takes place there in case of a tautomerism. So it's a general term of ligand where ligand can show variable redox as well as electronic state that is that deals with uh, that either ligand can show one electron oxidized form ele reduced form two electron oxidized form or reduced form then this is called non-innocent redox non-innocent system but simple non-innocence can be different thing not necessarily that should always be a redox non-innocent, right? A tautomerism as a one such example, which is also non-innocent, but not redox non-innocent. Okay. I hope I could clarify the point of uh, of the uh, person asked this question. Sir, there is another question. Yes, uh, yes. From uh, Shourab Mondol, that yeah. is, uh, that is, which is some different. Uh, uh, is there any special reason in oxyhemoglobin molecule for having superoxide state? Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, that's also interesting question because this thing I think is taught in the uh, BSc or MSc level when they uh, study the hemoglobin or myoglobin molecules and oxygen binding there. You see this when a superoxide is formed, the terminal oxygen or that unit becomes electronegative, right? Or rather some negative charge accumulates on oxygen atom of the superoxide because superoxide is O2 dot minus, right? So what happens because when you have a superoxide anion, you have a distal histidine uh, at a group in the, in the, in the, in the uh, oxyhemoglobin and then this superoxide and distal histidine forms a hydrogen bond. And that hydrogen bond, even a small amount of energy associated with it, but it actually makes a lot of difference in terms of dioxygen binding, which is called cooperative dioxygen binding. Because as soon as one oxygen atom binds, one oxygen molecule binds to the iron center and an iron-3 superoxo species is formed, 
and then it forms hydrogen bonding with the distal histidine. As soon as the distal histidine hydrogen bonding is formed, the conformation of the protein changes and three other heme center now become naked to oxygen. So in the presence of high amount of oxygen in lungs, all the three oxygen uh, iron center becomes oxygenated at the same time. And this is called cooperative oxygen binding. So nature have, mother nature has strategically made this system in order to make dioxygen binding in a high oxygen rich environment in lungs. Thank you. Okay, sir. There is no more question. Okay. Okay. Then I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Can you come on? Can you just uh, use ACM energies uh, as an index for assigning oxidation states? Uh, uh, you say ACM. that the uh, the microscopy. Scanning, uh, right. So scanning electron microscopy. Yeah. The, the the problem is that there could be an electron flow. Because when you are talk, working with a scanning electron microscope, between the probe and the tip, there could be an electron flow. And if there is an electron flow, your system may get, get reduced or further oxidized. So that might not be a very useful for the system, which has very strong, you know, uh, easy oxidized, okay. easily oxidizable yeah. or easily reducible system. So XPS, for example, is a very powerful tool, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, because you can use your sample properly and then you know where exactly your electron is ejected okay. from whether it is ejecting okay. from the metal center or not mm -hmm. and if this happens then you can probe the nickel center there because your xps can only see nickel not anything else okay, okay. more selective yeah 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 it's more selective. XPS is, is more selective. In fact, there are more selective techniques. For example, okay. uh, X ray absorption, no, X, X ray absorption, okay. prime structure is uh, another okay. technique. I think, uh, I think I will come to I see. Well, okay, I don't know. Yeah, okay. okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the uh, brilliant lecture, Papa. Yes, and uh, maybe we'll uh, see you in the sure, sure, sure. at some point. And, uh, Okay, and uh, I'll, I'll request all your uh, participants uh, to uh, give a uh, big hand to Professor Pai. Thank you. Thank you very much. With this, I think we'll conclude this lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tapon. Okay, over to Thank you, okay, sir. Over to the Sutopa now. Over to Sutopa. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, for your nice okay. presentation. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Mal. Uh, for chairing this session. Uh, so um, session one is over and we are now moving towards the second technical session, which is for the oral presentation from the participants. The presentations will be reviewed by uh, Professor Deepak Ranjan Mal, former Professor Department of Chemistry, Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, and Professor Subhas Chandra Bhattacharya, former Professor Department of Chemistry, Jadukpur University. We are happy to announce that the three best presenters will be felicitated uh, at the end of the webinar. The session will be chaired by Professor Subhas Chandra Bhattacharya. All the speakers are allotted with eight minutes time and a warning uh, ring will be given at seven minutes. The speakers are requested to adhere the time schedule. Participants are free to ask the queries in the chat box naming the speaker. All the speakers are re also requested to reply the queries in the uh, chat box uh, naming the participant. At the end of the webinar, the queries will be summarized and communicated to all the participants. Uh, let me announce the name of today's presenters. And uh, please present your, uh, pre please be present, the, uh, you are requested to be present there, here uh, accordingly. And the presenters are uh, Dr. Proshanto Patro, Dr. Otunu Mahato, uh, Ragin Ramdas M, Shushri Ghosh, Dr. Aparna Thakur, Dr. Khokon Shamonto, Dr. Shiv Shankar Dash, Dr. Koushik Chandra, Dr. Shadesh Ghosh, Moitre, Moitre Shoikia, 
and Dr. Tofonindu Kamilya. Uh, so now I welcome Professor Vattacharya to chair the session. Sir, please. Good morning to everybody. Uh, now, uh, the oral presentation session is started. Now, uh, please, all the participants, please take note that schedule time is eight minutes. So you have to complete your presentation within eight minutes. Now, I request Dr. Prashant Patro to present his presentation. Thank you, sir. Start. Uh, present now, Kuru Prashant. Uh, yes, uh, visible. Yes, uh, no, I can present now. Dr. Prashant Bhatto. Yes, sir. Uh, present now. Present now, yes. 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 Present now, Present now. Okay. A window. Yes. Share. No share option. Let's cancel. Share an application window. So much. Uh... Dandi ke present now. Kordan ne apni akono. Present now. Bol na. Just present now. Aste na to. A window. Uh, you, you can share the whole screen also. Yes. Visible? No. Hello. Abhi kindly complete screen share. Uh, हाँ ये window बोले तो वो share के option है just cancel जाकर चाहे just Microsoft ये PowerPoint okay okay share yes sir please select present I... now and then select entire screen entire screen एक this is slide show visible ना visible होते हैं ना आह प्रोशन तो तुम एक तो पढ़े बोल रहे ताहले मैंने उन ना रख जन के बोलते बोली सर that will be better uh, I think uh, he is trying to be ready and then I shall call Dr Atonu Mahata प्रोशन तो वो present होते हैं तो होते हैं then then uh, please प्रोशन तो Dr प्रोशन तो बस तो continue Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Slide show from beginning. Okay. Uh, thank you, all of you. Uh, now I do, I'm Dr. Prashant Patro uh, from Dharnam Raj College. Cholega chai, Prashant Dao. Cholega chai, Abar. Okay. Arak bar kodun. Okay. Okay. Present now. Uh, window PowerPoint share okay from the 
visible? Yes. yes. Something ah, visible, visible. Yes. Yes. Okay, okay. Now you can start. Okay, now I am Dr. Prashant Patra from Jhargram Raj College. Uh, now I am uh, presenting my uh, simple and efficient work entitled Synthesis of High Weight Chromeno. 4-3-B pyridine 5 ohm and 6-H chromeno 4-3-B quinoline 6 ohm derivatives in presence of EP3 and triethylamine and ammonium acetate in the presence of ethanol. Now, coumarin, a nature of natural and synthetic origins, uh, constitute a large family of heterocyclic compounds with uh, a benzo alpha pyronoid having uh, diverse bioactivities such as uh, antidepressant, antimicrobial, antioxidant. Uh, uh, mainly anti-cancer activity and anti-fungal uh, anti and antibacterial activity. Now, when coumarin uh, fused with pyridine in any positions are uh, commonly known as uh, pyridocumarin, naturally occurring pyridine fused coumarin, uh, santhiagonamine uh, antibiotics uh, uh, and goniothaline and polyneomarlin C are found in nature and they have uh, give so many bioactivity. Uh, related to uh, um, wood healing property, uh, anti-malarial property, and so on. Now, uh, the actually nomenclature actually this is coumarin, uh, which is known as a chromeno two ohm system. Uh, if we uh, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, this is the nomenclature. Actually, when it is fused with a pyridine ring, then the nomenclature is that uh, that uh, one uh, in carbon nitrogen is uh, a bond and uh, then it is B1, so nomenclature is 4,3P, actually 4,3P B system. Now if we uh, give the nomenclature, then it is high weight, then uh, it started from this nitrogen, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, but uh, uh, 4,3B from here, 1, 2, 3, 4, A, B, this is the thing. So it is 5 H chromeno 14, B period in 5 one and this is 6 H chromeno uh, 4,3B quinolone 6 one now in literature, uh, so many papers are there so having anti-cancer, anti-tumor activity reported in the literature, so, uh, having the 5H, uh, uh, 4, 3B uh, systems. When it is uh, um, so, um, huge, um, attached to it, uh, uh, nitrobenzene group, actually. This nitrobenzene group uh, enhance the anti-cancer activity uh, in reported in the literature. In that structure, it is also pyridocumarin. Then, when it is uh, fused with uh, indole derivatives, uh, then it uh, shows more uh, activity. Dichloro here, uh, the responsibility for the uh, more activity. So, from literature, it is concluded that uh, the structures related activity depending on the moiety as well as their uh, counterpart also. Now, uh, there are so many examples having anti um, fungal as well as antibacterial activity in the literature. So, so from uh, interesting from the above observations, uh, we trying to synthesize uh, in our laboratory uh, 5 H chromeno system. Actually, so many um, scientists of uh, organic chemists uh, have developed their methods uh, uh, from 4 hydroxy coumarin or enaryl uh, coumarin or um, four nitro coumarin uh, for, sorry uh, benz nitro benzaldehyde uh, from different name reactions mainly friendler uh, reactions or other uh, reactions also say developed uh, these systems now our methods uh, have so many advantage like high yields of the products uh, green solvent ethanol uh, was used uh, there is no metal uh, catalyst was used and no excess of uh, use of reagents and uh, the compound has been characterized without chromatography, which is the more advantage. Uh, now, the when we treated with uh, uh, four chloro three formyl chromarin, actually it is a uh, commercially available, and uh, actually we uh, it was prepared from our laboratory from four hydroxy chromarin from simply um, Bilsmeyer uh, reagent (UCLC DMF). Though the four chloro chromarin was uh, um, another byproduct, then uh, just uh, uh, acid recrystallization we got the uh, starting material when this starting material was treated with different uh, compound having active methylene group in presence of ethanol uh, 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 with uh, catalytic amount of triethylamine 
in presence of ammonium acetate at two equivalent at 60 degree centigrade, we got the uh, our target uh, product. Actually, we um, uh, very uh, um, take the four substrates at the width and the depth. So uh, four. Now the polymer mechanism of the reaction is nothing but first step is a simple Novanagaral condensation with uh, active methylene uh, group. Then uh, two possibilities are there, path one. First uh, amination, so addition elimination mechanism and uh, in cyclization with uh, followed by uh, dehydration. And another path, uh, just Novanagaral condensation then um, uh, ammonium acetate uh, in enolizable uh, uh, or then attack, there are also addition elimination process uh, after uh, elimination of each cell, we got the desired. Now, conclusion, we conclude that we have uh, elaborately explained the synthesis of the target compounds, uh, a backbone of natural product, uh, polynium marlin C, separate from 4 chloroxyformyl formyl and compounds containing active methyl group, a short and easy protocol, huge green solvent with no metal catalyst. Uh, I acknowledge uh, MRP Science uh, Technology, Biotechnology, Government of West Bengal, our college, Harjan Raj College, and uh, uh, I also thank you to all. Uh, and I also really thank you uh, Tertiary College, General and Degree College, to give the opportunity. Now, uh, thank you, Dr. So, now any questions from the participants? Questions are visible in the chat box, sir. Uh, hello, uh, Prashantu. Yes, sir. This is Professor Mal. Yes, sir. Uh, have you published the work? No, no, sir. Have you published the work? No, 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 sir. Just, uh, sir, uh, uh, more examples are required. Uh, so, why I... not? Actually, only four examples are there here. Actually, uh, ongoing work. Uh, now, do you speak it loud? Yes, yes, sir. Audible. No, but uh, I think the work is sufficient for publication, though. How many compounds? How many compounds have you made? Uh, it's a four examples. Four, four, how four examples. How many compounds have you made? Okay. Four examples. Okay. I think. Uh, 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 are they all characterized? Yes, uh, NMR. There are mass spectroscopy, actually 13C, only two uh, compounds are, uh, we got uh, 13C, this compound and this compound. Are they characterized? Yeah. Have you characterized the compounds? Yes, yes, by proton NMR and 13C and also literature's data. Okay. Actually, actually these compounds um, uh, in literature's also, for 3D compounds. Compound, actually. Compound, 3D. In literature, actually, um, uh, I think you should uh, publish it. It's a good work. Okay, okay. okay. Thank you, sir. This, uh, this example publish publish it. Okay, okay. Sir. One is asking, one is asking, what is the role of ammonium acetate here? Okay. Actually, ammonium acetate, the source of ammonium acetate, nitrogen source, actually. Uh, nitrogen source. Okay. So, Thanks to Prashant Patro, Dr. Prashant Patro, for his lecture. Yes, now, I request Dr. Otanu Mahato to present. Yes, sir. Am I audible? Yes. Start. Yes. Sir. Please, eight minutes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Are the slides visible, sir? Yes, yes. <coughs> you start. Thank, thank you, Dr. Bhattacharya, and thank to the organizers of KCD Government College uh, for giving me such uh, an opportunity to present myself in such a webinar. Now I am going to present my work entitled as Binding Interaction of a beta carbolane Analog in Cationic Alkyl Trimethyl Ammonium Bromide Micelles. 
in order to investigate the binding interaction between the fluorophore and the cation surfactant we have uh, uh, followed here the intramolecular chi transfer process that is icd process we have chosen the fluorophore as aodiq that namely as three acetyl four oxo six seven dihydro 12 hydrogen indolo 2 3 aquinolizing it is a polarity sensitive by chi transfer fluorophore we have uh, selected here three cation surfactants namely acetyl trimethyl ammonium bromide that is ctab tetradecyl trimethyl ammonium bromide that is ttab and dodecyl trimethyl ammonium bromide that is dtab containing 16 14 and 12 carbon atoms in their uh, alkyl chain length now the main objectives of our work will be stated as follows to investigate the photophysical and dynamical behavior of aodiq in cationic micellar environments to study the binding interaction between the fluorophore and the cationic micelles to study the effect of polarity and rigidity of the biomimicking microheterogeneous environments to explore the effect of surfactant chain length on the rotation and dynamics of the fluorophore now at first we will discuss about the steady state absorption study in aqueous medium aodiq shows a broad unstructured and lowest energy absorption band uh, at around 420 nanometer which is indicated by the red color our gradual addition of the cation surfactant that is dtab ttab and ctab to the probe solution there is a remarkable red shift of about 7 nanometer in all the micellar media uh, which reflects that the ground state of aodiq experiences a lowering in polarity in micellar media compared to that of pure aqueous medium now we will discuss about the steady state emission studies. AODIQ and aqueous medium shows a broad unstructured lowest energy emission band peaking at around 520 nanometer. Uh, gradual addition of CTAB, TTAB, and DTAB to the fluorophore solution. There is a huge enhancement in the fluorescence intensity along with a uh, uh, remarkable blue shift about uh, 33 nanometer uh, in all the cases. The blue shift in the emission maxima suggests that the polarity of the micellar media is less than that of pure across media. To assess the mode of binding between the fluorophore and the cation surfactants, we have calculated the respective binding constant values uh, using the alum green equation. And uh, it is clear that uh, the binding is stronger with CTAV than DTAV to TTAV. To assess uh, the probable location of the fluorophore, uh, in uh, micellar media, we have uh, studied the micropolarity measurement, uh, monitoring the fluorescence uh, behavior of AODIQ in uh, micellar as well as uh, uh, aqueous medium. We have calculated the respective uh, micropolarity values, um, and it is obvious, and we have found that the uh, micropolarity values in all the micellar environments lie in between the polarity of bulk water, that is 63 and the polarity of the uh, non-polar hydrocarbon core which resembles to uh, n hepton that is 31 uh, and uh, it, this indicates that the fluorophore resides in micellar water interspecial region and does not penetrate into the micellar core region uh, it assess the probable location of the fluorophore and uh, we exploit the steady state fluorescence and isotropy in order to show uh, the effect of increasing hydrocarbon chain length towards the molecular restriction of the fluorophore. Uh, in all the micellar environments, the fluorescence and isotope of AODIQ increases remarkably and uh, reach at the saturation levels. As we move from DTAB to CTAB through TTAB, uh, it is found that an increased alkyl chain length increases the micellar compactness, which in turn increases the fluorescence and uh, From the results, it can be concluded that the fluorophore resides in more rigid environment in CTAB uh, than that of TTAB and then DTAB. Uh, to explore the local environment, we exploit the time-dependent fluorescence or lifetime studies. We have, uh, uh, we have observed that the AODIQ shows by exponential decay characteristics in your water as well as micellar environments. We have calculated the mean process lifetime values. Uh, however, it is seen that the lifetime values uh, in, increases slightly from uh, in micellar media than that of pure aqueous medium. Uh, and it can be concluded that uh, the fluorophore experiences a emotionally rest restricted region in micellar environments. Hmm. Now, to characterize the rotational relaxation dynamics uh, of the fluorophore, in uh, micellar media, we 
we have studied the time result fluorescence and acidity measurements in aqueous as well as micellar media. Uh, AODAQ shows uh, moon exponential decay uh, in aqueous medium with a reorientation time of about 150 picosecond, whereas by exponential pattern is observed in uh, micellar environments. The exponential pattern may, may be ascribed due to the two regions. So one obvious region is that the short and the long component of the decay is, the, is due to the rotational division of the free die and the micelle bound die. And another region is the rotational division uh, of the die bound to two distinct regions. The observed by exponential decay uh, can well be rationalized in terms of two step obling in a cone model. According to the model, the fluorophore undergoes a slow lateral diffusion on the surface of the micelle and a fast obling motion uh, that is uh, that are coupled to the overall rotation of the micelle. As we move from DTAV to CTAV through TTAV, uh, uh, an increase in uh, alkyl chain length found to increase the micellar compactness, which in turn increases the average rotation of relaxation time. Uh, the determined fluorometric uh, parameters suggest that the fluorophore resides in micellar interfacial region and does not penetrate into the micellar core region. From the previous discussions, we can make, we can make the following conclusions, uh, that the photophysical and dynamical behavior of AODIQ have been explored using both steady state and time resolved fluorescence techniques. Uh, the fluorophore uh, resides in micellar water interfacial region and does not penetrate into the micellar core region. And we have uh, found that the muscle under stress in imposed on the uh, fluorophore increases with an increase in the certain chain length from DTAV to CTAV through TTAV. Uh, now, thank you for your kind attention. Any any questions from participants? Okay, no, I am asking one question. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, uh, is, uh, what is the uh, difference in what is the difference in uh, lifetime? What is the difference in lifetime? Means lifetime of the probes within the micellar medium. Have you studied? Yes, sir. There is an insignificant difference. The lifetime value do not change appreciably. Okay. Uh, and uh, we can uh, conclude that the uh, with increase in the alkyl chain length. From, yes, CTA, yes. from DTAB to CTAB through TTAB does yes. not affect the decay characteristics of AODIQ. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, any other questions? So, since there is no other questions, so thanks to Atono for your presentation. Thank you, sir. Mm. Thank you, Dr. Mati. Thank you, madam. Now, and thank you, Dr. Mal. Okay, thank you. Yes, now, now I request Ragin Ramadas M. Be ready for presentation. Am I audible? Yes. Is it visible? Yes. Okay, sir. Continue. I'm Dragon Grandas, going to present dual stimuli responsive polytriazoles via click polymerization. I'm working as an assistant professor in Rajagiri School of Engineering and Technology, Kakanad, Kerala. So, for explaining about uh, stimuli responsive polymers, all of us know that these stimuli responsive polymers are some special class of intelligent materials. They have the capacity to memorize their shape upon exposure to certain external stimulus like light, heat, magnetic field, etc. And this kind of behavior we can see in our nature. For example, plants like touch me not and chameleon are the examples for stimuli responsive behavior observing in nature. And for generating shape memory behavior, 
we need two kind of segments for the first one is hard segment and the second one is soft segment hard segment can be physical or chemical and the soft segment can uh, can be either glass transition temperature or melting temperature so with the combination of this cross links and switching segment anyone can generate shape memory behavior and for developing this shape memory nature different kinds of chemistries are utilized for example radical polymerization cyanide epoxy reaction epoxy amine reaction etc and for developing polytriazole shape memory networks i used click chemistry as the root and here i mainly utilized copper catalyzed acid alkane cycloaddition reaction what is mean by copper catalyzed acid alkane cycloaddition reaction this reaction is the catalytic version of our common one three dipolar cycloaddition here a dipole is reacting with a dipolar profile in presence of cuprous iodide catalyst and polytriazole networks are formed the main scope and objective of this work is synthesis and characterization of some clickable monomers synthesis and characterization of shape memory polytriazoles evaluation of shape memory behavior with dual stimuli for developing this polytriazole network i utilized two kind of reactions first one is acidation and the second one is propargylation triglyceride ether is taken and it is acidated in presence of sodium acid ammonium chloride using bmf as the solvent and the obtained monomer is denoted as a3 a3 means monomer with tri functionality bisphenol af is taken and it is propargylated in presence of sodium hydroxide and propargyl bromide and the obtained monomer is denoted as pf and the trisacid monomer is characterized by stir spectroscopy the n double bond and stretch is stretching is obtained at 2105 cm inverse and the ox stretching is obtained at 3364 cm inverse further trisacid monomer is characterized by proton nmr also the epoxy content of the parent compound and after uh, acidation is 6.3 milli equivalent per gram and 0 milli equivalent per gram the second monomer pf is characterized by stir spectroscopy the ch stretching is obtained at 3274 cm inverse and alkynic stretching is obtained at 2125 cm inverse the hydroxyl value for the propargylated species is 0 and proton nmr spectrum ascertain the conversion of this bisphenol af into propargylated bisphenol af and after this this trisacid monomer and pf monomer is taken in 1 is to 1 molar ratio and it is click cross linked using the uh, catalyst copper iodide and the maximum cross linking temperature for this polymerization is obtained from dsc and it is 140 degrees celsius and this structure represents the schematic representation of polytriazole the click reaction is characterized by taking stir spectroscopy before and after and after click polymerization this acid peak get vanished which confirms the completion of click polymerization reaction and also there is a small peak observed at 1381 cm inverse which confirms the presence of triazole ring this dsc represents the cross linking temperature for this for this reaction is 140 degrees celsius for learning about the glass transition temperature and storage modulus of this polymer dma analysis is taken with heating rate 3 degree celsius per minute at 1 hertz the switching temperature for this polymer is 103 degree celsius and this polymer exhibit high elastic ratio 44.3 and the heat induced shape memory studies are done with the help of fold deploy test fold deploy test is actually a bending test using that test we can calculate the shape recovery and shape retention ratio of this network and its 98 percentage and this picture represents this uh, demonstration of shape memory you can see that this is the original shape and after exposing the stimulus we fix that shape into a temporary one then within 60 second that polymer is getting recovered into its original shape now we have to study about the solvent induced recovery of this polymer for that purpose we took two kinds of solvents they are type 1 solvent which is aprotic in nature and type 2 solvents which are protic in nature and we observed that for type 1 solvent there is a single stage recovery and for type 2 solvent there is a two phase recovery means this type 1 solvent is getting recovered to its original shape due to the uh, physical swelling in type 2 solvent the polymer is 
recover uh, getting recovered into its original shape due to the assistance of physical swelling as well as hydrogen bonding because the hydrogen bonding factor for ethanol is higher than that of this type 1 solvent in type 1 solvent we can see that polarity factor for example if you are taking dmf polarity factor is 13.7 so that is getting dominated so due to the assistance of polarity factor that polymer is getting recovered and for explaining the mechanism of this solvent transport we utilize semi empirical fickian model and the equation is log qt by qe is equal to log k plus n log t where n value gives the uh, mechanism uh, which is adopted in this uh, solvent transportation and for the solvents like ethanol dichloromethane ethyl methyl ketone we observe the value higher than 1 so we can say that it follows non fickian model but for methanol we observe that the value is 0 0.26 so it is following a Fickian diffusion. So by observing this value, we can say that the formation of cracks which is formed due to the recovery in type 1 solvent is independent of diffusion kinetics. And this is a shape memory demonstration in acetone, methanol and ethanol. And you can see that in acetone, there is some cracks on the surface of the recovered shape. This crack is due to the uncontrolled stress release. And we, we can't see that kind of cracks on the methanol surface. And also we can learn about the uh, shift in hydrogen bonding of this polymer by taking FTIR spectroscopy in solvents before and after. And this is a schematic representation of hydrogen bonding shift in ethanol in dry compound this triazole is getting bonded with its own OH but in ethanol triazole is getting bonded with ethanol OH and this is a schematic representation of mechanism of chemoresponsive shape recovery in chemoresponsive shape recovery in acetone DCM and MEK we can see uncontrolled recovery but in ethanol and methanol we can say controlled recovery without cracks so the main conclusion obtained from this work is Crossing the polytriazole is synthesized by this click polymerization and this polymer possesses blast transient temperature at 103 degrees Celsius and this polytriazole is actuatable by multiple solvents and in hydrogen bonded solvents like acetone the recovery of SMP follows a two stage kinetic profile and this SMP is not actuatable by water. So I have to uh, I have to acknowledge my director Rajgiri School of Engineering and Technology principal and also Dr. Sandosh Kumar KS colleagues in our set and organizers of this webinar. Thank you all. Okay. Any questions from any participants? Uh, I, have, I have a question. Professor uh, Bhattacharya, I have a question. Yes. Okay, uh, okay, okay, Dr. Ragin, uh, have you tested ah, yes. the thermal stability of your polymer? Ah, I tested the thermal stability using TGA, but I didn't show here. Okay, what is that temperature? The thermal stability of this polymer at T10 percentage is like uh, higher than 200 degrees Celsius. 200 degrees? Above 200 degrees? Uh, above 200. Oh, okay, thank you. So, uh, one question. So, hydrogen bonding solvents, uh, uh, you have to choose the uh, solvents uh, which are uh, the richer in the hydrogen bonding formation that solvent will be uh, most helpful i think yes sir if you are taking hydrogen bonding solvents we can exchange or shift that triazole bonding with the hydrogen bonding solvent factor for example if you are taking acetone that co will can bond with uh, this uh, triazole ring okay. if you are taking ethanol that oh can bond with triazole ring so that is why we chosen that hydrogen bonding and for confirming that we took the help of this FTAR spectroscopy. We observed that if you are taking virgin spectroscopy that OH value is comparatively sharpened. But if it is, if the polymer is immersed in the solvent that OH peak is getting broadened. Okay. Thanks to Mr. Dagin for his... Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, next speaker, Dr. Sushi Ghosh. Am I visible, sir? Yes. Am, yes. am I audible? Uh, audible, but not visible. Yes. Yes. Now, now visible. Slice, sir, visible, sir? Yes. Thank you. Please continue. 
Good afternoon, everybody. I am Shushri Ghosh, a research scholar from University of Kalani. Uh, I am here to make a short presentation on nanomaterial-based dark delivery system, present status, and future prospects. Since ancient time, humans have widely used plant-based natural products as medicine, and natural compounds with differ different molecular background present a basis for the discovery of novel drug. And the case, and the in this case, uh, the use of large size materials in drug delivery causes major challenges, including in vivo instability, poor bioavailability, poor solubility, and also there are some issues with the target specificity delivery and their probable adverse effect as well. Therefore, using this new delivery system for targeting drugs could be an option that might solve these critical issues regarding our conventional drug delivery system. And in this case, nanotechnology really play a crucial role in advanced medicine and drug formulation. Now moving to my next slide, let us look at the figure. The figure is actually showing different aspects of controlled drug delivery applications. And these are delivery duration, targetability, drug release, route of administration, drug properties, biocompatibility, and nature of material. And these important aspects we should keep in our mind when designing a nano delivery system. Now, these are some advantages related with nano sizing of drug. These are increased surface area, more fast onset of therapeutic activity, enhanced solubility, limited specificity, and target specificity. And this is an example of target specificity. As we know, in cancer chemotherapy, cytostatic drugs damage both malignant cells and normal cells. And damage to these healthy cells cause severe side effects. But nanodrug delivery selectively targets those malignant tumors only. Now, these are some pictures of different nanomaterial-based drug delivery system. And it will be difficult to illustrate all the figure within this short time period. But I'm going to illustrate some of these. As we can see here, polymeric nanoparticles, a large number of biopolymeric nanoparticles are there, which are utilized in the drug delivery system, like cytosan, alginate, xanthan gum, and cellulose. Xanthan gum, especially, high molecular weight polyanionic heteropolysaccharide produced by the bacteria Xanthomonas campestris. And uh, here is a picture of nanoliposome. These are closed membrane structure analogous to a cell membrane. They facilitate uh, uh, incorporation of drug in them. And there is a picture of polymeric micelles Michel made up of amphiphilic block polymers and that form a coarse shell structure in aqua solution. Dendrimers are highly bifurcated nanostructure with a core different surface active groups. There are uh, different kinds of inorganic nanoparticles include silver, gold, iron oxides and silica nanoparticles. Uh, nanocrystals are there and these are Pure solid drug particles. Uh, these are hundred percent drug without any carrier molecule attached to it. Quantum dots. These are semiconductor mm, non nanocrystals in two to ten nanometer range. And as we can see, there is a picture of uh, cylindrical picture of nano carbon nanotube. Carbon nanotubes are cylindrical structure consist of benzene ring and use as a carrier for treatment, uh, for, for, sorry, carrier to transport protein or vaccine. In our laboratory, we have synthesized silver nanoparticles from different plant species, bacteria, and the use of this, nano, uh, of this synthesized nanoparticle uh, in this nanomaterial-based drug delivery system can be evaluated in near future. 
and here is a piece of information regarding current scenario of nanotechnology in medical field uh, there are 51 products based on the nanotechnology which, which are currently being applied in clinical practice now the future of this new drug delivery system present day it is certainly among the most fascinating areas of research and a lot of research is still going on in this field and it has already led to the uh, filling of 1500 patents and completion of several dozens of clinical trials now i am going to conclude my topic with this fact that this process is still in a research and development phase and we will need to find new material with more specific application and we also need to find new processes those are cheaper and can uh, produce nanoparticles in large quantities okay and these are some references regarding my work there is one question i think uh, yes sir is asking which bacteria have you used is asking for the synthesis of pseudomonas sir pseudo pseudomonas sir different varieties of pseudomonas are basically used for synthesizing nanoparticles then have you stabilized the silver nanoparticles because it is prone to oxidation if you uh, Ha uh, yes sir. Ha. Uh. Ha uh, sir yes sir uh, their stabilization is checked with with uh, um with uh, with uh, UVB spectrophotometry their stability can checked uh, can be checked uh, okay. in... any any questions from After... mm. Okay since there is no other question so i thank dr sushri ghosh for our presentation thank you now i request now i request dr aparna thakur yes sir for presentation yes please continue yes sir slides are visible hello not now uh, you are audible but not your uh, slides is visible any problem unable to share my slides yes i uh, you uh, please open open your slide uh my open your slide the slide in uh, mobile phone then uh, yes. you uh, see is yes 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 is it visible is it visible yes okay okay thank you so much uh, for all the convener of this activity of this uh, international conference this is uh, a golden opportunity as well as the privilege for me to present my paper over here so uh, my paper is based on the green synthesis methods and studies of multi wall carbon nanotube uh, with 
uh, it's nano nano composites with conducting nano polymer uh, polymers actually most of the time the uh, we face the problem of coagulations or allograations of multi wall carbon nanotube this is the major challenges for using these uh, uh, carbon nanotube for these purposes but generally they have the very positive uh, expect that while um, uh, forming uh, exoherder or endoherder compounds these this conducting polymer they enhance their conducting uh, uh, properties as well as their thermal stab stability and generally the these type of compounds are used as a sensor in uh, uh, different type of uh, uh, defense and uh, different purposes like uh, the sensation of ammonium gas and as uh, and other purposes so uh, but uh, i have used one uh, green method in the previous literature i uh, i have observed that generally they have uh, synthesized all these compounds uh, uh, through the uh, use of organic solvents as a medium uh, uh, that impose limitations towards handling uh, uh, solvents their isolations and separations from reaction batch and disposal to the environment recently the potential uh, of supercritical fluids has an alternative to organic reaction media and has been recognized due to their inherent in expensive non toxic and non inflammable feature for synthesis of various material so in this uh, study the uh, the importance of synthesis all these na compounds is uh, uh, is uh, very much applicable because generally these compounds are used for different purposes like sensors actuators photovoltaic cells hydrogen storage material and as well uh, as my previous um, presentation a presenter has told that it has been used for drug delivery targeted drug delivery also because of their uh, uh, their uh, nano uh, size we can uh, uh, we can form an uh, unstable endoherdal compound with carbon nanotube and then we can target it uh, to the uh, to the organ and it can be released in my in my work i have used this, this super critical carbon dioxide reactor for this purpose i have used one initiator uh, ferric chloride and uh, generally i have purified multi wall carbon nanotube is used without purification and all the monomers which are purified through distillation under reduced pressure for this purpose first of all i have charged this vessel as you can see this vessel in this in this figure of supercritical carbon dioxide the reactor was charged with the monomers Uh, 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 pyrrole and uh, thiophene mm. at a particular temperature it will be 90 degree celsius and the pressure was 1200 psi and uh, uh, if the reaction has been uh, uh, taken more than 40 hours or uh, uh, to uh, produce or to synthesize these compounds after then the uh, polymers as well as the nano composite composites obtained through this method in nano composite it takes almost 40 hours and in case of mono polymers it takes around 18 to 24 hours uh, for two different type of conducting polymers pyrrole and thiophene uh, monomer uh, after this uh, completion of this reactions the reactor was cooled down and the carbon dioxide was vented off for studying the uh, for studying and for the confirmation of the compound formation we have generally used different methods i am explaining here the uv visible spectra uh, for, which was recorded in chloroform over spectro factor photometer uh, model genesis 10 and ftir spectra uh, of uh, recorded uh, in kbr over berkers ftir spectro photometer and tan images were scanned on zeol uh, 1011 using copper grid with primary beam of voltage of power 80 kW so here are the figures of tam which has been studied at different scale for the uh, pyrrole uh, uh, for the nano composites of polypyrrol uh, and multi wall carbon nanotube as well as polythiophene and multi wall carbon nanotube so in the um, uh, in this study micrographs at one at different scale 1 micrometer 0.5 micrometer 0.2 micrometers are here um, and uh, it has shown 
uh, that the presence of clusters of multi ball carbon nanotube uh, into polypyrrol phase increasing uh, the magnification up to 0.5 micrometer uh, indicate the debundling of multi ball carbon nanotube particles into polypyrrol phase as it is shown in figure a and b and further it uh, shows the deposition of uh, on increasing the mag magnification we can clearly show uh, show uh, see the uh, the deposition of polypyrrol over multi ball carbon nano sur surface at figure c is it visible yes figures are clear clearly visible to all of you yes, and uh, uh, same in the case of uh, polythiophene uh, uh, we can uh, see the non uniform deposition of uh, Uh, PTH over uh, multi-ball carbon nanotube uh, uh, in figure number uh, in figure E, and um, uh, it is clearly showing that there is an increase in diameter of pristine multi-ball carbon nanotube, which was uh, in virgin form. It has the 80 nanometer of uh, of uh, diameter. It can it, it has a range of 80 to 90 nanometer, but uh, in the figure it has been expanded to uh, one uh, 16 nanometer. and in case of polythiophene it has uh, in case of polypyrrole it has been uh, shown exohedral compound formation and nanocomposite formation and uh, it is showing 160 uh, nanometer and in case of polythiophene it is showing uh, the expansion uh, of diameter up to 140 nanometer after this confirmation we have studied about the uv visible spectra of these compounds as you can see in the uh, graph i have taken uh, the uh, uv visible uh, graph for polypyrrole polythiophene uh, uh, virgin multi ball carbon nanotube and its compound n1 with polypyrrole and its compound n2 with polythiophene and observation corresponding to polythiophene and thiophene is observed at 242 262 uh, 6, uh, 264 uh, 248 and as well as up to 260 nanometer variations with the compound and uh, uh, the in case of nano composites the uh, the observation has been absorption was uh, observed for polythiophene and, uh, and multi ball carbon nano tube it is 245 and polythio uh, poly sorry for polypyrrole and multi ball carbon nanotube it is 245 and for polythiophene and, and carbon nanotube uh, it is a uh, 260 uh, sorry really sorry uh, for multi ball carbon nanotube it is showing absorption as 245 260 and 293 nanometer with maximum at 260 nanometer but in case of uh, uh, monomers homo uh, polymers and uh, it and in case of nano composite it is clearly showing the bathochromic shift or blue shift which is confirming about the formation of compound and uh, uh, the formation of uh, polymers and it is uh, uh, 242 for pyrrole 239 for polypyrrole and it is 233 for the polypyrrol and multi ball carbon nanotube nano composite and uh, it okay so the next uh, i have studied the ftir uh, micrograph for it and uh, for in ftir results pyrrol is showing uh, in virgin pyrrol is showing its uh, its peak at uh, for nh uh, at 3412.56 frequency and for ch it is showing 2930 for uh, carbon carbon double bond it is showing 1673 but after the polymerization polypyrrole is showing the uh, the uh, the sharpness of the peak is reduced and it is it becomes blunt and it uh, it is showing uh, the peak for nh is 3427 for ch 2937 for carbon carbon double bond 1635 uh, and for carbon nitrogen uh, bond it is showing 1458 Uh, ranging to 1438 and for in case of thiophene it is showing a specific peak for ch at 2923 and for carbon carbon double bond it is 1635 for cs bond uh, it, uh, these are hetero uh, nucleic compounds both are hetero nucleic monomers thiophene and poly uh, and uh, uh, pyrrole it is a 269 for cs bond 269 to 665 
uh, and in plane there is a uh, one one thousand hundred. Later on, uh, with the formation, uh, with the formation of exohedral compounds with multi-wall carbon nanotube, it a pyrrole is showing uh, sh uh, uh, NH at three uh, thirty-four four four six, and uh, and for uh, uh, CH it is showing twenty-nine hundred thirty-seven, and for CH uh, um, uh, delta it is showing one zero twenty-three. Uh, as well as it is showing a, a specific peak showing the ring deformation due to compound formation at 298.15 frequency uh, thiophene in the presence of multi wall carbon nanotube is showing a specific peak at 190 degrees please, uh, please, at 190 please complete your lecture the time is up okay 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 sorry so thank you very much okay any questions uh, So you have synthesized multiple wall nanotubes. Pardon, sir. You have synthesized multiple wall nanotubes, multiple wall, not single wall. Okay. Uh, next, I request Dr. Kukun Samanto. Yes, sir. Please start. डॉक्टर अपर्ण ठाकुर प्लीज स्टॉप योर प्रेजेंटेशन डॉक्टर अपर्ण ठाकुर प्लीज स्टॉप योर प्रेजेंटेशन एम आई विजुअल एंड ऑडिबल नो 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 अपर्ण ठाकुर प्लीज स्टॉप योर शेयरिंग स्क्रीन Okay now, uh, Dr. Hopun Samanta, please present now. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Am I visible and audible? Uh, no, present. Present now. Present now your slide, please. Am I visible? Na, who can do? You be present now. Ta koro. Present now. Ta hoy ni ta koro. Koro. Na koro chhi. Asal hai. Agar jen. Hoy ni tu me kete aur ek bar koro. Press koro. Acha, so. Is it visible? No, no, no. Oh, no. Please share your screen. Not sharing. Yes. Is it visible? No. 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 The topic and an unusual observation towards the pyrolysis of calcium salt of alkoxy benzoic acid. Actually, in our journey, we want to synthesize this type of polyaromatic hydrocarbon, and this is our strategy, retrosynthetic strategy, to obtain the polyaromatic hydro. This type of polyaromatic hydrocarbon. 
and du during the synthesis of this polyaromatic hydrocarbon we need to the starting material this type of ketone symmetric ketone and we know that the dry distillation of calcium salt of aliphatic and aromatic acid is well established procedure for the synthesis of symmetric this type of symmetric ketone and this is a common textbook reaction and we want to utilize this textbook reaction to synthesize this type of symmetric ketone using the calcium salt of the corresponding acid but when we synthesize we uh, distilled in vacuum condition the alkoxy benzoic acid that is when we heat the calcium salt of benzoic acid we obtain the benzophenone but when we heat or distilled in vacuum condition the calcium salt of alkoxy benzoic acid this type of alkoxy benzoic acid surprisingly we obtain the a star not the expected symmetric ketone and we tabulated this observation and we elaborated this methodology using another alkoxy benzoic acids on dry distillation under vacuum condition and we also entries 13 entries also this is happen in sn2 fashion mechanism and involved in the breaking of the alkoxy aryl ethyl linkage this weak nucleophile attack in the in in sn2 fashion in the ethyl linkage and we produced this ester and we collect this residue which on acidification produces the corresponding acid which is isolated and characterized and we established this mechanism actually this procedure is very simple but interesting uh, but this procedure for synthesis of ester has uh, no longer such uh, greater importance but has a notable academic importance and also this is a novel procedure for the uh, breaking of the aryl alkyl ether linkage which is strong one by sn2 process and thanking you and thanking everyone and this is the spectroscopy uh, selected spectroscopy and i gratefully acknowledge the organizing committee and all the participants and reviewer and thank you again to all of you okay any questions from anyone uh, professor mal had asked a question okay sir actually i have forgotten i have a question yes, yes sir normally see the driving force for sn1 sn2 is basically uh, solvolytic uh, conditions okay yes, but yes sir yes sir you are, you are carrying out the reactions under pyrolytic conditions which are uh, free from solvents yes sir yes sir this is free from solvent normally pyrolytic reactions follow two category uh, two uh, reaction pathways one is radical pathway other is uh, pyrolytic uh, sorry pericyclic pathway So yes, uh, I doubt how can you actually invoke uh, SN one SN two. This this would not be acceptable. Actually, actually we proposed. Actually we proposed, but uh, uh, didn't uh, yet know the what is it, this is radical mechanism or SN two pathway. Just we proposed that this is SN two pathway. No, I think I just uh, just careful. Uh, yes, careful. Think about because uh, normal um, uh, as to my knowledge, yes, uh, as for my knowledge, uh, yes, actually pyrolytic reactions uh, fall under only two categories. Pyrola uh, pericyclic or radical. Okay. Yes, so sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Think, think about it. Think about it. Oh. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. For your suggestion. Okay, uh, okay sir. Uh, since there is uh, time is up, that is why uh, I thank Professor Samanto for his. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next participant, Doctor Shiv Shankar Das. Please. Delivery your presentation. Yes, yes. Am I audible? Doctor Shiv Samudha, you are audible, but presentation. Okay, okay. Are you seeing my slide? Yes, yes, yes. 
Uh, I can start now. Yes, yes. Uh, good afternoon uh, to all of you. I myself, Dr. Shivshankar Das, Assistant Professor, Department of Chemistry, Salgoni Government College, would like to present a talk on the biosynthesis of Aracana seed extract mediated whole nanoparticles and its catalytic applications. The content of my presentation is, includes preparation of extract synthesis of whole nanomaterials, their characterization, mechanism of stabilization, application of whole nanoparticles, and conclusion. Firstly, the Aracana seed was purchased from the market and grind it properly through the grinder and finely powder. 50 gram was taken in a digger with a purified ethanol 100 ml and keep it for overnight at room temperature. And interestingly, red color solution was obtained and then we filter it and evaporate it under the um, vacuum and we get a reddish powder that is known as the seed extract of the Aracana. The deep red color is due to the presence of large amount of anthocyanins as reported in the literature that imparts the red color to this extract. Now we are using this extract for the synthesis of the gold nanoparticles at room temperature. When we use the chloroauric acid, a certain concentration to the seed extract, a, a, a gold nanoparticles instantly formed and where the concentration of the plant extract varied from 100 to 400 mg per liter, but the concentration of the gold remained fixed. The color, instantly observation of the color indicates the formation of the gold nanoparticles. Then we go for the characterization of the gold nanoparticles by the several techniques. Initially, we use the UVG spectroscopy where a sphere band in the 545 nanometer indicates that the formation of the gold nanoparticles at the room temperature. And a blue strip was observed that it indicates the formation of the smaller size nanoparticles. Then we go for the morphological study by the HFTM where we get the particle size of average 15 nanometer and almost all the particles are the spherical in shape. And EDS spectra also confirms the gold particles are the consisting of the gold atoms. Then we go for the extra diffraction pattern of the gold nanoparticles where we get the distinct four peaks with high intensity for the gold nanoparticles which also confirm the crystallinity of the gold nanoparticles. And for the participation of the various functional group present in the phytochemicals in the stabilization of the gold nanoparticle and compare the FTIR spectra of the plant extract as well as FTI spectra of the gold nanoparticles where we can confirm the participation of the OH group uh, in the stabilization of the and other uh, NH group also in the particip participation of the and stabilization of the gold nanoparticles. Then we propose a mechanism as the polyphenolic compound and anthocyanins with their uh, dihy with their one to hydroxy moiety. Uh, so they initially form a five membered chelated ring with the gold C plus ions and reduced them to the AU0. Then AU0 coupled to collide with each other to form the gold nanoparticles, and at this stage they get stabilized by the oxidized form of the polyphenols, which is quinones, and as well as other unreacted polyphenolic compounds and get stabilized in the nanoparticle uh, form and they could not uh, grow further. Then we use the freshly prepared gold nanoparticles for the use of the uh, catalysis use where uh, it can for nitrophenol to four aminophenol in the presence of sodium borohydride. The reaction is not happening in the absence of catalyst at the because of very high energy barrier of this reaction. But as long as when you add, add the little amount of gold nanoparticles to the solution, it instantly uh, reduced to the um, four nitrophenol to the four aminophenol as we confirmed the, uh, the kinetics from the kinetic study. And as the concentration of the sodium borohydride is much, much larger than the four nitrophenol, so pseudo fast order rate kinetics is proposed. And Ln Ct versus C0 versus time plot gives us the rate constant for the reaction where it was measured at 0 0.30 uh, And this is the conclusion, the seed extract of the Aracanat can be utilized for the facile one-step synthesis of the gold nanoparticles under mild condition. Characterization of the gold nanoparticles reveals the formation of the highly crystalline spherical shaped gold nanoparticles with average particle size 15 nanometer. The gold nanoparticles have also been utilized as an efficient catalyst 
for the reduction of the four nitrophenol to four aminophenol in the presence of sodium borohydrate. So we can conclude the seed extract of the arachanid has tremendous medical medicinal significance. Result described here will be useful in the biomedical science and other nanoscience and nanotechnology. The work has been published in 2019 in Asian uh, Journal of Pharmacy and Pharmacology. Uh, uh, thank you for your kind attention. Okay. Okay. Any questions from participants? So, so I am asking one question. So, yes, you have synthesized the uh, uh, size of the particles in 15 nanometer. Yes, sir. So, and uh, how are you uh, sure that the, it is um, uh, AU3 plus AU0? Have you measured its uh, redox potential? No, sir. Actually, we did not measure the redox potential, but we also measure the EDX of the particles that it is consisting of the gold zero. Okay. Okay. Uh, I have a question. I have a question. Actually, uh, uh, could you have published this paper in a chemistry journal rather than a pharmacological journal? Yes, sir. Could you have published this work in chemistry journal rather than a pub pharmacological journal? Sir, actually, I have tried several journals, but uh, at last I published here. Oh, but oh. Uh, it. Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, any question, Professor Mal? No, no more, no more questions. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yes, thanks to Dr. Sipshankar Das for his presentation. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Now I request Dr. Kaushik Chandra. Yes. Dr. Sipshankar, please uh, remove the presentation slide. Okay, thank you. Am I audible and my slide is visible to all? Yes. Continue. Good morning, everybody. First, I would like to thank Dr. Shomo Martin and Sudapa uh, for giving me a scope to present the work. I have, I have today. I have chosen my topic uh, entitled "Using Natural Compounds and Nanomaterial to Tackle the Extra and Endogenous Advanced Life Oxidation." Basically, in my talk, I would like to highlight a compound which will suppress or prevent the formation of the advanced glycoxidation which is very uh, which causes the detrimental effect in the diabetic patient <clears throat> now before i go into my talk just to brief about the differences between the glycosylation and uh, glycations what happens is that protein and sugar molecule can combine to each other by enzymatic way to produce an adduct the process is known as the glycosylation. It is the most fundamental process for the binding of the protein and sugars, uh, which is termed as a post-translational modification with the formation of glycoprotein. And this is a very important physiological process because the structure, stability, and the function of the protein is determined by the, <coughs> by the combination of these two reactions. Here you can see that this that this glycosidic bond has been formed with the nitrogen of the protein molecule comes from the uh, comes from the protein molecule to generate this N-link glycosidic linkage. On the other hand, the protein and the sugar moiety can also combine to each other non-enzymatically, and the process is typically termed as the gly glycation. Unless the glycos uh, glycosylation, the glycation is a multi-step complicated <coughs> reaction cascade which produces hundreds of the product and it is completely non-specific and irreversible in nature and since there is a formation of many products during the course of the reaction this process is is a kind of pathological process so there are many complications of this process and one of such complications is a diabetic complications in which 
the in is the four pathway of the diabetic complication one of the pathway is the ag pathway now we are curious what is ag the true form of the ag is the advanced glycation end product in this advanced glycation end product the protein and the reducing sugar like glucose are first combined to form the sip space which occurs within within few hours up up to that it it produces the amatory adduct formations by amatory rearrangement which takes normally uh, not uh, normally of weeks and after uh, and after few weeks or even months they will produce the number of the advanced glycation product during the formation of the different kind of products in the medium there are many oxidative <coughs> oxidative uh, um, intermediate are generated the for example the dicarbonyl species like the glyoxal the methyl glyoxal the dimethyl glyoxal are formed which again reacted to the protein molecule to produce different type of the non fluorescent and the fluorescent compound and one of such complication in this reaction is the formation of the protein linkage which typically occurs in presence of the lysine and the arginine so there are mainly two types of the protein constituting are available and which occurs during this reaction during the late uh, glycation stage where the intermediate of the precursor or the glycated form of the uh, protein molecule again reacted to another protein molecule to produce the different type of the fluorescence and non fluorescence cross linking aggregates and which can be isolated and thing is that this uh, in the in our in our body there are two ways to form the ag one is the source of the endogenous formation of the ag another is the exogenous form of ag which mainly comes from the food and the reaction which involves in the non enzymatic glycosylation process are are divided into three categories the first step is the formation of the sip space the second step is the amatory product formation in the third step which is considered to be the late glycation stage the formation of the different ag product along with the cross link product now the thing is that since this this reaction which makes the complication in the diabetic patients and under the hyperglycemic condition and the oxidative stage now it is important for us to stop this reaction so there are three step where, where we can actually target <coughs> in target uh, target to stop or to prevent this reactions so naturally we must need some strategy to inhibit the ag formation so in order to do so the the most common method is the uh, is the inhibition of the ag by using either the synthetic inhibitor or the natural inhibitor but we are mainly focused on the natural inhibitor because they are mainly the secondary motor metabolites they can be excreted in the pure form with the retention of the stereochemistry and they are most bioavailable and there are many example of the natural inhibitor which are potential candidate for the ag and one of such uh candidate which we are mainly interested is the saponin and saponin is a combination of the triterpen and the glycosylic linkage and we are interested in the saponin by, by <coughs> prompted by the saponin we have chosen our uh, target compound is a gymnemic acid now this gymnemic acid which is a anti diabetic uh, compound and we wanted to see whether this anti diabetic compound has the potential Uh, candidate for the anti ag activity now in order to do so we first <coughs> make the uh, wanted to see whether this compound is uh, uh, is uh, does have a, does have some uh, reactivity on the uh, on the molecule because it needs to be reacted to the biomolecule naturally the reactivity is important on the uh, the surface reactivity is important for this molecule in order to do so the molecular electrostatic potential surface plot has been designed in which the <coughs> red surface indicates the electrophilic interactions because of the less potential of this zone whereas the blue indicates the more potential and more polar character are involved in this reaction and combination of these two we finally conclude that it is the triterpene part containing the functionality which is more important for the interaction with the biomolecule so uh, uh, after one we then <coughs> isolate the uh, one, the one minute, one minute. Okay.
isolate the uh, gymnemic acid and we have characterized uh, this molecule by NMR and the mass spectrometry and after that we perform the inhibition study and we first found in the absorption spectrometry that there is hyperchromicity occurs by the perturbation of the gymnemic acid in the AG moiety and there is this spontaneous coinching with the increase in the concentration of the gymnemic acid uh, uh, incubated in the AG from 10 micromolar to the 100 micromolar <coughs> and that that uh, inhibition also increases with increase in the temperature uh, uh, from 45 to 50 to 65 degree there is a spontaneous inhibition occurs yeah. now we wanted to know whether there is a <coughs> hydrophobic interaction or not but in presence, in presence of the in presence of the ANA experiment in presence of the stop your presenting in the of the there is a quenching occurs and which indicates there is a hydrophobic interaction. In order to correlate this phenomena with the theoretical one, uh, then we also experimented in the NMR spectroscopy where we found that from the BSA to AG formation there is a change in the spectra and after the activated Also, there is a change in the spectra mostly in the hydrophobic region. So we suspect that the interaction with hydrophobia. So in order to correlate this one with the docking study, we also found the mostly the hydrophobic amino acid which interacted with this uh, gymnemic acid and on the titerpin moiety especially. So finally we can uh, we can conclude that this is <coughs> uh, this is uh, the gymnemic acid with uh, the saponin moiety is very important target for inhibiting the uh, AG formation for the diabetic patient under the hyper, uh, hyperglycemic condition and the oxidative stress and we, this is also collaborated with the, our UV and fluorescence study and the animal study and finally the inhibition is typically hydrophobic in nature which is also supported by the document study. And I am also thankful to my collaborator, my students, uh, student, my students uh, in PDF and the funding DBT and the CSO. Thank you all for your kind questions. Thank you. Uh, I think time is up. That is why, uh, if any questions, please ask uh, Dr. Chandra separately. Now I switch over to another participant. Uh, now, Dr. Chandra, please. Okay. Please. The sound is audible. Uh, sound is audible. Audible, but not visible. So the one minute, just just one minute. The so slide is visible. Yes, yes, <clears throat> yes. Can I start now, sir? Yeah. Yes, yes. Eight minutes. Good afternoon. Today, I am discussing the topic which is entitled as tie block copolymers as potential delivering system of synthesized pyridine and pyrimidine derivatives, experimental and theoretical explanation. First of all, we have to choose two C base. One is named AP and another name is ANHT. The AP is the pyrimidine moiety containing C base and another is the pyrimidine moiety containing C base. The, we have already known that the pyrimidine moiety is an integral part of DNA and RNA. Besides, the pyrimidine moiety have many biological significance. Due to many biological significance of pyrimidine moiety, we have synthesized the pyrimidine moiety containing C base NHP and another the pyridine moiety containing C base AP. Now we have choose the two tri-block copolymers. One is P123 and another is F127. P123 and F127 contains the structural unit as a polyethylene oxide and polypropylene oxide block. The polyethylene oxide is basically hydrophilic in nature and polypropylene oxide is basically the hydrophobic in nature. In this work, 
two different types block co polymers have been used as delivering system of this pure water soluble drug molecule ap and nhp so this is the big challenger for researchers to who delivering the drug which is pure insoluble uh, in water so in this work the drug delivering efficiency of block co polymers have been investigated by different spectroscopic technique like absorbance fluorescence dls and time resolved fluorescence measurement now the synthetic root of ap molecule the methanolic solution of anthracene 9 carbaldehyde is mixed with pyridinyl hydrogen and the resulting mixture was replaxed 12 hours then orange solid ppt is obtained and this compound is ap molecule and this ap molecule is characterized by different spectroscopic technique like ir nmr and mass spectra and this is the first figure this is the nmr spectra of the ap molecule and the second figure this is the ir spectra of the ap molecule and it is basically designated as c double bond n peak and stressing frequency and also the n stressing frequency and this is the third figure represent the mass spectra of the ap molecule now the similar uh, sip base that is the nhp molecule the 35 dimethyl pyrimidine hydrogen is mixed with the methanolic solution of anthracene 9 carbaldehyde and the resulting solution was replaxed 12 hours then a yellow colored compound is obtained and this compound is ap molecule and this end hp molecule is characterized by different spectroscopic technique like photon nmr 13 cnmr esi mass spectra and aptr spectra this is the first figure represent present the nm of the nhp molecule and the second figure 13 cnm mass spectra of the nhp molecule and the third figure this is the mass spectra of the nhp molecule and the fourth figure is the ir spectra of the nhp molecule now the experimental outcomes of this work the absorbance of ap molecule has been recorded at 460 nanometer in aqueous solution due to pi to pi star transition but with the addition of p123 polymer solution to the ap molecule the absorbance of ap molecule is increased whereas with the addition of ap127 to the ap molecule the absorbance of the ap molecule is increased but in this case Uh, but in this case initially up to 0.65 millimolar concentration a new peak is generated at around 498 nanometer after addition of more than 0.65 millimolar of ap127 ap127 then absorbance again increases at 460 nanometer this new rate peak indicates that a entrainment of ap molecule within the hydrophilic p block of ap127 this result indicates that gaun state interaction takes place between ap molecule with p123 and ap127 but the absorbance spectra of nhp molecule have been recorded at 400 nanometer due to pi to pi star transition but with the addition of p123 and ap127 to the n it is no change of absorbance of nhp molecule it indicates that there is no gaun state interaction takes place in between nhp uh, in between nhp molecule with p123 and ap127 now the emission spectra of ap in p123 ap127 polymer solution and same for the nhp in p123 and ap127 polymer solution on the excitation of ap molecule at 460 nanometer the emission spectra of ap has been recorded at 560 nanometer but with the addition of p123 up to 0.5 millimolar the fluorescence intensity of ap molecule is increased with a large amount of hypsochromic shift the similar observation is observed with the addition of ap127 to the ap molecule like absorbance spectra initially a red shift is generated at 564 nanometer but after the addition of 0.56 millimolar concentration then the fluorescence intensity of ap molecule again increases 516 nanometer uh, it indicates that it indicates that a large it indicates that the uh, ap molecule is entrapped uh, in p123 in ap127 and this interaction takes place uh, ppo block of p123 and ap127 and molecule ap molecule 
Nextly, on the excitation of the NHP molecule at 400 nanometer, the absorbance of NHP molecule is recorded at 500 nanometer. But with the addition of P123 up to 73.3 micromolar, the fluorescence intensity of NHP molecule is increased and in this case a large amount of hypochromic seed. The similar observation is observed with the addition of F127 to the NHP molecule. Here, we have seen that for the saturation of the AP and NHP molecule, the concentration of P123 is lower than that of the AP127 solution. Here also indicates that P123 is strongly binds with the AP and NHP molecule. And this observation can be rationalized in terms of this observation can be rationalized in terms of binding constant and this binding constant is calculated by the Almgren equation. From the binding equation data, we have seen that the P123 is strongly bind with AP and NHP molecule than that of the F127. One minute more. Here, one minute. Just one minute. Okay. One minute. Okay, sir. Continue, continue within one minute. Okay, one minute. okay, 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 okay. P123 is strongly bind with AP and NHP molecule. It indicates that the interaction of AP with AP and NHP with P123 is greater than that of the F127. Here, this is because of the that this is because of the fact that P123 have uh, 70 polypropylene oxide block, whereas in F127 have 65 polypropylene oxide block. And next, for the confirmation of the steady state fluorescence measurement of the AP and NHP molecule, the time result fluorescence measurement of AP and NHP molecule. The uh, lifetime of the AP molecule has tie exponential decay with the average lifetime 0 0.72 nanosecond. But with the addition of P123 to the AP molecule, the lifetime is decreased 0 0.7 to 0 0.59 nanosecond due to the decrement of the second component molecule. But the first but the first component and the third component molecule is increases which indicates that which indicates that the increase of the steady state fluorescence of the ap molecule but okay. with the addition of but with the addition of the p1 to 3 of the nhp solution the lifetime of the nhp is increased from it uh, increased from 0 0.1 nanosecond to 0 0.86 nanosecond now the next slide we have uh, no, please, also please stop, please stop. Huh? Okay. Just, just one slide. Just one slide. Well, okay, 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 okay. And this is finally conclusion. Here uh, uh, we have uh, concluded that the P123 is strongly interact with the NHP molecule in the P micellar region, whereas the P123 interact with the AP molecule is the micellar region. The binding constant of the P123 with AP is greater because it interacts with basically micellar solution and that's why the P123 is the best choice for the drug carrier than that of the AP127 solution. And finally, the, the acknowledgement, I would like to thank my supervisor, Professor Super Sundra Bhattacharya and also I'd like to thank all my parents and lab mates and also the organizer committee of the International Women's Seminar. And okay. finally, thank you for kind of Thank okay. you. Any question? The time is up. So, since there is no other question, so uh, thanks to Dr. Sadez Ghos for his lecture. Okay, sir. okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Dr. Mohan Is he present? Moitri Saikia. She is not present. Okay. Then Dr. Tapunendu Kamila. Now I request Dr. Tapunendu Kamila to present with. <laughs> Sir, I am audible. Uh, yes, audible, but not. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, sir. I am Dr. Tapanundu Kamila, assistant professor, Department of Physics, Namajul Raj College. My topic is protein nanoparticle interaction and necessity of biocompatible nanoparticles. Now, nanoparticles have immense applications in biomedical engineering and drug delivery 
as for example silver nanoparticles have been we know that widely used for the preparation of different cosmetic clothing newest consumer products and destruction of cancer cells also zinc oxide nanoparticles are used in sunscreen lotion it is well reported that in the earlier literature or existing literature that bare nanoparticles when they enter entered into our body they are almost coated with protein after entering into biological fluid as a result unfolding of protein and losses of its activity is reported therefore bare nanoparticles are not biosafe therefore the concept of biosafety and biocompatibility is a key issue in favor of application of nanoparticles in human body especially the biomolecules having different functional group can be used for capping the bare nanoparticles therefore the post surface modification of bare nanoparticles by capping them with biomolecules is a technique that facilitates the biomedical research it is very challenging to fabricate the safe bio conjugate nanoparticles for drug delivery and another pharmaceutical product preparation now in our work we have taken three nanoparticles one is zinc oxide one is pbs and another is silver and protein coated silver at first we have prepared the zinc oxide nanoparticle by chemical reaction method and then interaction with protein albumin where we have found that and the so peak of protein at 280 nanometer that is no shifting but when you taken that time variation spectrum absorption spectrum before by mixing with fixed concentration of protein with nanoparticles and we taken the absorption spectrum with time we, we have taken that we have found that the intensity of protein peak is gradually decreasing and that the change in intensity is plotted with time and fitted by exponential association mechanism here we have found two time constant one is for electrostatic interaction and another is for unfolding now these are the same images this is the images of zinc oxide nanoparticles and here is the images of protein nanoparticles mixed here is the nanoparticle of zinc oxide and the almost covered by protein this is called the nanoparticle protein corona and this is the corona is two type one is hard corona and another is soft corona where the interaction is slow we have found the hard corona where is interaction very high we have found the uh, hard and soft also corona which will be showed in the next slide and we will so taken the cd spectrum we have found that due to interaction the alpha helix of the protein is decreased and now beta cell increases and this reports the unfolding of the protein also we have taken the fluorescence spectrum where we have found the fluorescence quenching due to interaction of the protein with nanoparticles zinc oxide nanoparticles and also we have taken the fts spectrum we have fitted the fts spectrum of amide one band by targeting the peak position fitting that the alpha helix beta c beta trans and inter and intermolecular aggregates where we found that intermolecular aggregates increases and also the in case of being zinc oxide be a cap nanoparticle in, uh, we have found they are the losses of alpha alpha helix now this is the images of another set where we have found, taken that that sample changed the protein is fixed bsa and the nanoparticle is highly active the pbs where we found that this is the all the experiments were same before the which we have found in the zinc oxide protein cases they are the only the team images we have found here that this is the hard corona and this is the soft corona like flower like structure and we where we when we can the magnify it we have found that the particle size is 5 nanometer and the hard corona size is 7 nanometer we all know that the dimension of bsa 4 into 7 into 4.5 nanometer this is the one dimensional reaction growth and other outside we shall found the soft corona and this is the factorialized structure we have fitted the factorial equation and then get the factorial structures also we have found in case of t1 and t2 before the like uh, others experiment and also the fluorescence quenching and also we have taken the uh, fps spectrum and where we have uh, fitted and have found that the components are very larger than the before experiment here we have found that the gradually decrease of alpha helix is very less now uh, this is third set we have prepared bare silver nanoparticle and protein cap silver nanoparticle bare silver nanoparticle is prepared by chemical reaction method very known procedure and protein cap silver nanoparticle is prepared by 
like by you know, people by introduction in, introduce the geno3 into egg white and then the repeated procedures known procedure and we have taken that the absorption spectrum of 414 uh, nanometer for uh, silver and 280 for proteins in mixed nanoparticles and for bare nanoparticle we have found that 390 nanometers also the protein peak was found at 280 nanometer this the images and we also taken the tm images here we have found the bare nanoparticles all the and this is the protein cap nanoparticle where we have found that uh, uh, nanoparticle is covered by a layer of protein whose dimension is 4 nanometer earlier i have told that the dimension of uh, bsa or a albumin is 4 into 7.7 .7 nanometer and this proves that this is the dimension of protein and this is the layer of protein now this is the schematic representation of how the nanoparticle uh, protein cap nanoparticle is formed and this is the we have to we have to uh, interact these two uh, nanoparticles with hemoglobin in case of protein cap hemoglobin we have found that there is no shifting of solid band of hemoglobin which is uh, very interesting features of hemoglobin and solid band or por porphyrin rings therefore the porphyrin rings of solid band is not bended or any perturbation was done also the oxy deoxy bands are in same position in case of protein cap nanoparticle but however we have mixed hemoglobin with bare nanoparticle we have that solid intensity has already increases and the peaks uh, uh, shape is changes from gaussian to lorentzian and we just fitted all of us and other um, techniques which i have not shown here and finally in case of uh, fluorescence case we have uh, added the hemoglobin uh, hemoglobin with bare nanoparticles we have found the fluorescence quenching but however when we added the uh, protein nanoparticles, we have not found that any fluorescence quenching only the intensity increases due to, due to the presence of protein in case of protein cap nanoparticles now this is the last figures we have where i have taken the hemolysis assay here is, we take taken the two control positive and negative control and bare protein cap nanoparticles and we have found that bare gun nanoparticles uh, confirms more hemolysis than 80 percent compared to um, positive control but to, to less than 20 percent is covered by protein cap nanoparticle if we um, if we found that uh, when I change the concentration to lower concentration, the hemolysis assay is very low, less than 15 percent. So therefore, in conclusion, we have found that bare nanoparticles interact with uh, blood plasma protein due to protein uh, due to interaction with protein the, with the inter nanoparticle protein is unfolded and protein coated nanoparticles are more biocompatible than bare ones. Protein coated nanoparticles can be used for drug delivery. Now I acknowledge the UCDA consortium for scientific research and also DA unit and also my research scholar Deva Sajj and Dr. Amit Kumar Bhunya. Amit Kumar Bhunya is also um, obtained his PhD. Now, thank you to all of you. Any questions from any of our participants? So I, I just I am asking one question. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, you have said that uh, due to interaction, protein become unfolded. Huh. Uh, so, to, uh, how have you uh, find it? I have found it by two types. One is FTR spectrum, and another is CD spectrum. FTR CD? spectrum alpha, uh, CD yeah. spectrum alpha helix and beta seed keeps the uh, folding, a folded and unfolded nature of protein. If we found that the beta uh, beta seed increases, the protein become unfolded. Have you done the Have you made the anisotropy of these solutions? No, and I have not done the anisotropy. I have directly measured the CD spectrum and okay. FTS spectrum. Okay. And FTS spectrum, I have fitted the peak position by targeting the peak, peak positions. Okay. These peaks intensity become changed. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Okay, sir. Pamela for your nice presentation. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you, Professor Bhattacharya for chairing the session. Thank you, Professor Mal and Professor Bhattacharya for reviewing the oral presentations. Now we are at the end of the first day of our international webinar. Hope you have enjoyed all the sessions. Thank you all for being here and having patience. Please give your feedback for today in the form already given in the chat box. 
we will meet again tomorrow at sharp 9:30 am in the morning you will again get google meet link for tomorrow through mail we are concluding now for today thank you very much